channel, you should have received um, a link to the Google Spreadsheets with the new IP addresses that we're going to be using today. Uh, you can log in with your username and password that you've been using. Um, if any of you are still having issues with the servers that we were using yesterday or the day before, um, we are doing, we're doing everything we can to make sure that y'all have access to that again in the future. So um, if you could just, I'll set up something so that y'all can let us know if you're still having issues with the old ones so that we can make sure that we, we can do that. So, Okay, we got five minutes before we're going to start our first one today. So uh, just a heads up on that. We've got a couple yeah, people. Thank you. 
Okay.
So two of the four are fixed. <laughs> okay, And so I have to like go all the way here to just see between them. So I just use this so I can like see what's going on. And the red is a. So now people can see what they see? Yeah. Online? Mm -hmm. Is it okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but just to see in this case. Oh, well, this one I have stuff right now because they're having issues. Oh. They're having like logging issues, so I thought it would be good while they're trying to like problem solve them. Because like, I think they were doing like something different with them in the previous one. And so people were having like logging issues or gateway stuff, so now they're like, troubleshooting. That's why they're doing the extra little uh, event today to kind of like do a tutorial on how to like get the streaming. Yeah, the streaming is working. No, our stuff was good. Their stuff, they had yeah. it. In fact, the streaming is always like, oh, yeah, there's this one. Yeah.
Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for coming for the fourth day. I'm uh, Todd uh, uh, Grekus, and I'm a, a professor at NYU. And Alex is a grad student in my lab who's going to help do the presentation today on uh, Cytric. Um, so if you don't know what Cytric is, I'm about to tell you about what it is. But uh, give you a little overview of what we'll try to cover today. Um, uh, first thing we're going to talk about a little bit is just Mechanical Turk. So how many people have heard of Mechanical Turk? Or OK, so everyone's heard of it. How, how many people have used it in some way for data collection? OK, so a lot of people are familiar with these kinds of things. So for the one or two hands that didn't raise up, but we'll do a relatively brief overview of like Mechanical Turk issues. Uh, and then uh, we're going to give an overview of this tool that we've created along with a lot of other people called SciTurk, um, which aims to try to make uh, running Mechanical Turk experiments um, easier and also to enable things like direct replication of uh, scientific research and maybe in, in gender like future um, uses of um, mechanical Turk for behavioral sciences. Um, and so we'll do some hands-on stuff and some lecture stuff and we'll kind of move back and forth between the, between the two. Um, so things that you need uh, to work hands-on, at the very minimum uh, you need to register for an account on SciTurk.org. So uh, if you go to visit SciTurk.org um, and slash register, there's like a, a, a site where you can create a user account. And uh, um, I think it sends you an email just to verify. But you just go through those steps so that you have uh, 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 an account with uh, SciTurk. And then technically you're going to need uh, to create, uh, if you don't already have one, but so many so of you already raised your hand of using Mechanical Turk, you, you need a Mechanical Turk uh, account on Amazon Web Services. Um, uh, to actually use SciTurk, I think you'll be okay not uh, having it just for the demo purposes, but if you ever want to get into actually using it, you'll have to create that account. And um, so uh, it's useful to kind of go through the steps for doing that. And uh, this, uh, I'll show you some documentation later that can show you the steps on that. Um, yeah, so the doc. So SciTurk has extensive documentation online that we'll go over a little bit. It has a really active Google groups at, uh, where a lot of people ask questions and get help. and uh, there's a number of people that are helpful at answering questions on that thing, so that's actually a really useful resource. But of course, you can, uh, in the context of today, uh, use your red and blue sticky notes if there's anything that you're unclear about. If I don't get your attention because I don't see the red sticky note, you can always just raise your hand or stand up and shout or something like that. Okay, so uh, I think the idea um, uh, that to at least to introduce things is to talk about online data collection. So you know, think of like the way that laboratory research, and at least in psychology, Maybe certain aspects of experimental economics have been done over the last, uh, you know, 100 years or something like that is a, is a kind of a situation where at least it's morphed today into a thing where it's kind of a typical office style interaction with a computer. Like people usually come into a lab someplace on a, on a college campus and they sit down in front of a computer and it's sort of like an OSHA approved uh, interface for or taking part in this experiment. So you, you have general control over lighting and temperature, the temperature is pleasant, the viewing angle of the computer might be controlled. Uh, you, you kind of generally bring in just a few people at a time uh, and have them work on individual workstations. Maybe you only have one or two people at a time. Uh, and the data would then be saved to like just a local disk and then you have some way of file server to kind of collate the data across the different people that you run and stuff like that. But a typical online experiment, um, meaning like one that's delivered you know, using web-based protocols, like uh, introduces a whole bunch of new interesting challenges, including like the fact that you no longer have any control over those things that we usually take for granted in the, in the laboratory setting, right? So we don't have control over lighting and temperature. We might be getting people from an international subject pool that may speak different languages uh, or have different exposure to the type of thing that we're gonna ask them to do on like Psych 101 students. Um, we might be uh, in a situation where we could enable uh, letting hundreds or maybe even thousands of people take part in an experiment in a relatively short period of time rather than kind of the one uh, at a time drip by drip that we get in typical laboratory settings. And then, um, and because of that, there's certain technical issues that come up about how to correctly deliver these kind of things. And it gets you a little bit into the realm of like, you know, just general web application development or something like that. Like how do I make sure that my code is scalable? How do I make sure it's not buggy? Make sure that it displays correctly on many different types of devices and many different types of uh, computers and many different types of languages and things like that. So um, it's uh, sometimes it's a bad thing actually for the type of research question that you have because you don't have those control of, of those, those factors, but in many cases it might actually be useful to have large data. So the biggest source of data that people probably have used is, me is Mechanical Turk, which I'm, I guess many of you are familiar with. 
I kind of like to think of like, uh, maybe it's like a little bit overly dramatic, but it's like Mechanical Turk is probably like the fMRI of behavioral science in the sense that, you know, when fMRI was developed, it kind of pushed uh, cognitive neuroscience forward in a dramatic way in the sense that it enabled non-invasive imaging of functional brain activity. Uh, and uh, Mechanical Turk is sort of similar in that it's had a kind of revolutionary impact on the rate of research publications that people can do because, um, I mean, at least I was, uh, you are all young faces that don't even remember this, but I was definitely of a generation uh, when I started graduate school where um, if you, you had to run one experiment a, a year or a semester or something like that to get 100 people in it because you had to do one by one at a small college or something like that and it would be really difficult. So um, Mechanical Turk has enabled small, uh, uh, smaller universities, individual students, even graduate students to have resources that enable them to get really high throughput uh, standard experiments. But the potential for what you can do looking forward has actually not been explored that much. And maybe Dallinger is going to talk a little bit about some of the, the things that you can do that are even more advanced with it. But the potential for this kind of platform to really change the type of experiments we do um, has really not been explored enough yet. Um, but uh, and so it's an exciting time to like think of like new ways that we can do experiments online um, using using Mechanical Turk. But like uh, like um, fMRI, so fMRI is like a, a good thing in a lot of ways. Um, it also has some difficulties in interpretation. It may not be the best measure of brain activity. And mechanical Turk also has issues, some of which I'll talk about right now. Like, so it may not be, it, it, it's great, and it also may have, but it's great with a set of caveats that you need to know about. Okay, so, you know, it was developed by Amazon. It's, a, it's essentially a corporate product that Amazon still maintains. They developed it, uh, they call it like artificial, artificial intelligence. The idea was really more for applications in machine learning situations where they wanted, uh, they were like sort of, I think the, the example was de deleting duplicate product listings on Amazon's website in cases where it was not obvious that there were duplicate listings, like maybe um, the, some of the metadata fields were a little bit mismatching between two product records and the photographs of the, of the product, like a lawn chair were from different angles and stuff like that. And so they wanted to clean up the database of all these repeated listings and they went to their, uh, you know, uh, machine vision people and said, how could you solve this problem for us? And they were like, well, it's going to cost a lot of money to do an object recognition system and make it work really well. Like maybe what we could do is just create a system where we pay people like 10 cents and just show, like the human visual apparatus, which is very good at detecting similarities and commonalities across different viewpoints, uh, solve the problem for us. And they're like, okay, cool. And so they made this website that basically cleaned up their website and they use it in house lots of things and they decided to open it up to the public and let them let them use it. So it's used for lots of different uh, tasks, sort of essentially for that um, originally. Okay, so key term terminology that we'll use throughout the, the, the session here, and I'll carry forward into the downer thing too, I think is like um, uh, HIT, it's like a human intelligence task, that's what it stands for. So it's like, a, it's kind of like a unit of work on Mechanical Turk, like it, and it depends on you what you want to stack into a hit. Like in some cases, a hit might be like a single trial. Like if you just had two images and you asked the person, are these the same view of this, of this uh, a different view of the same product? Yes or no, that might be a single hit. Or you could have a hit be, um, uh, we have hits that are, uh, have people learn some material and come back a week later and take a test on it. And so it could, and that means that they have multiple trials, lots of information to maintain over a period of time and then get a test at some, uh, a week later or something like that. So uh, it's flexible about what you stack into a trial and it kind of depends on what kind of experiment you want to do. So the typically the one trial things are kind of ones where you uh, don't care how many trials a subject does or you know you just let them keep going as, long, as much as they want to do. So you might have some people do a thousand of those judgments and some people might do 10 or 10 one, or just one of them. Uh, whereas if you, have a, if you want to make sure everyone does the same amount of work for your experiment, then it makes sense to sort of make the hit be um, the unit that you pay them for is to complete the entire experiment, like complete your entire uh, session. So a requester is who you are, that's a researcher who's posting the hit, and then a worker is a person who performs the task. Um, and like I said, the type of tasks that are going on, if you go on as a worker, it's kind of interesting. You can see the different kinds of tasks that people ask you to do. Um, they like write positive reviews for products online, translate uh, things between different languages, uh, provide keywords for images, um, but a lot of it is, in, or at least a significant portion is, is actually helping with science. So um, people uh, from many different research labs with many different backgrounds post, you know, uh, survey data or perception or learning experiments online and people uh, essentially 
get paid to take part and help with the science by being a participant in the, in the studies. So worker breakdown, this stuff is a little bit, this is probably like now getting to be like seven or eight years out of date, so it may not be completely accurate, but um, the general demographic is actually not that different than uh, typical undergraduate uh, psychology pool, uh, actually. So uh, it generally trends a little bit younger than the average US population, you, as you can imagine, because people have to be technically savvy enough to want to like sign up on this scary Mechanical Turk website and like do work over a browser, right? And so it ten generally tends towards like a median age of like 30. Um, it, it, it apparently it's got a good mixture of males and females. Um, it, uh, and then there's a kind of a large uh, demographic within the United States and then there's a breakdown across other countries. There's sort of an overrepresentation in India uh, 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 amongst the workers, partly because of something about how Amazon originally was uh, allowing uh, cash outs of the system in uh, rupees or something like that and encouraged more uh, Indian workers to sign up. Um, uh, and yeah, and so generally, I guess in 2011, this is like sort of a, a website that just tracked the IP and ge geolocated the IP address of many workers for a period of time to see like where they were coming from and they, they're, they're distributed all across the, the globe. Obviously noticeably absent in North Africa and large parts of uh, Central Asia. But uh, So one thing that I always have a feel as like a moral responsibility when I talk to people who are thinking about doing mechanical drug research or people who are already doing it who may not have thought about these issues is the idea that these are real people that are on the other side of the thing. So it's a little bit easy to become depersonalized, right? Because the, the more and more the technology becomes abstracted away from the traditional setting of a laboratory, um, uh, you don't think about the person on the other side. So like, you know, I think if you, uh, if you're the one running, if, if you're the PI, you often don't meet that many of the individual subjects. And so for you, when you tell a sub, uh, your student, grad student or something like that, uh, go pilot the study with 10 people, you're not thinking through like a little bit the, like the fact that they're going to have to meet these people and shake their hand and have them come into the lab and like take part in an experiment. So you really don't want to waste their time on a dumb experiment or a, a wasteful thing. And it becomes even more extreme in this online environment where essentially you're writing like a line of code or something like that that's recruiting these people who you never actually have to meet, you don't know anything about, and they just kind of like start doing this task online. It's easy for you to kind of just be like, well, whatever. I mean, if they want to do it for money, like, you know, they, like, Fine, and I think that's like a little bit of a dangerous thing, probably because it's important for us as uh, scientific researchers and representatives of universities and institutions like that to put forth like a kind of um, moral and ethical uh, high road, I guess, with respect to how we use the system and how we take and how we interact with the workers on the system. So there are some like uh, kind of anthropological analyses, I guess, that people have done of like the kinds of people that are working online. And of course, there's a lot of diverse backgrounds, but there are some interesting stories that sort of tell tale of the kind of people who are often on Mechanical Turk. So especially after the economic uh, crisis uh, that happened in 2010 and 11, people uh, went, turned to Mechanical Turk as a way of uh, getting uh, like a, you know, sort of like a living wage outside of, in, in places where they maybe not have access to as many jobs, right? So if you're, and so there's like an example story here about this person, Stephanie Costello, who did an interview with someone who uh, lived on a desert town in the southwest and had an associate's degree in nursing and, ever, and since uh, 2007 um, she started doing some mechanical Turk work uh, during downtime at her work and then she ended up losing her job in the 2008 recession and basically what started off as just extra cash became main source of income for this person uh, and according to a 2010 study uh, that situation may be represent of about one in eight Turkers in America or maybe one in five worldwide that are actually depending on this money for uh, a living wage. And so I think that feeds into a couple of things. One is how we conduct the research, but also like things like how quickly you pay people, right? Because it's often like, you know, you as a grad student, you might be like a little bit um, uh, like scatterbrained with regard to like being really excited about getting your data. And so you post some hits online and you get the data going and you're so excited to see your data and you're like, yeah, I, I gotta go credit those people and pay them, but like, whatever, I never met them, I never see them, I don't know how they're gonna contact me except for email. Like, you know, is there really incentive for you to pay them within like really quick time? But like, if you think a little bit about the fact that these are real people that are actually doing the work voluntarily, or you know, not voluntarily, but for, for money, but sometimes they depend on the money, what might seem like a small amount to you may be more, more significant for other people. I think it helps try to uh, adjust your attitude towards using systems like this. Um, and that is the, re and so it turns out that like studies that ask like why workers are doing this stuff, 
most of them are doing it for, uh, for money. Some people are like sort of more, maybe more obsessive compulsive and so they like do it for just the intellectual enjoyment of doing tasks, right? Like I guess it's not any less sensible than playing video games all the time or something like that. Like you're solving problems that people ask you to solve and they keep changing and being different each time you do them and you have to read instructions and then oftentimes they're really helpful and give you feedback and like write you emails and say like, oh, I thought this about your task and you should fix this. And We've had ones where people are really good JavaScript programmers and write and say like, you've got a bug online term. You should fix it. <laughs> so, um, um, so generally there, there's, a, there's a number of reasons, but generally money is a big, a big thing. Um, yeah, so it's worth keeping in mind that even though they're just a, a mouse click away, the crowds are made up of people. Okay, so uh, why, why do it? Well, um, it's convenient. It, uh, relative to running laboratory studies, it's fast. Uh, it's generally affordable, so um, most workers will sign up for, uh, it's basically considered a pretty good pay rate, I think, the kinds of, uh, if you match the amount that you pay in the laboratory, or maybe roughly in that realm, like so people who do laboratory studies, I guess the going rate in New York at least would be like eight to $12 an hour for doing a, like a psychology study that did involve going into a scanner. Um, so if you pay someone $8 an hour on Mechanical Turk, that's like one of the more lucrative uh, pay rates that you can get, uh, and and it's and that's like if you know that that's gonna you're gonna do a task for an hour, it's sort of better than like hunting freelance for like a bunch of 15 cent clicks that you're gonna hopefully get paid for, and so uh, it's it, um, so but that said, it's like affordable for you because if you, that means that you're only paying like maybe two dollars for like a 15 minute session, and so if you uh, want to run a typical s a powered a uh, psychology study, which is probably underpowered, but like, you know, you, you, if you run a typical size study, then you're only spending like $100 or $200 per research study, which is incredibly affordable actually, when you look at it from the perspective of how expensive it is to do most other types of uh, behavioral and social science research that are much more um, um, uh, strenuous, I guess. Um, there's some upsides to the anonymity. So I was saying like, I was initially casting the anonymity in a negative way, like, uh, it's bad that you don't get to really interact with those people in the sense that you might not think about the ethical consequences of things that you're doing, but it's also really good in some ways because um, it keeps you at kind of an arm's length from the subject. So, there, so uh, Alex and I actually have a, a kind of a, a opinion commentary recently um, in this IEEE proceedings thing about how um, web-based experiments essentially allow the gold standard of direct replicability, which uh, a lot of people in social sciences are interested in. So there's this claim that some people make that there's no such thing as direct replicability because there's always like a context under which something is collected, right? Like even if it's the context of who the experimenter uh, was, like, you know, like maybe their gender or something like that sort of is a context that then might influence how people behave and you can never really separate that out from the behavior. But what's really nice about online experiments is essentially like every interaction you have with this person has been scripted with in code, right? Like it's just a web page and you control the JavaScript and how it works. And so it means that if like, if I give you my code, um, you can run my exact experiment against the same like hypothetical population, mechanical Turk workers, and that is as close you can get to a direct replication as possible because none of those other extraneous things that weren't controlled for are really possible. Like it's been prog programized or whatever, or per made, made programmatic. And so that's a really cool thing about it actually. And that replication thing uh, is really powerful because of the fact that you can share your code for your experiment and people can uh, build on those things but also uh, 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 directly replicate things. Um, that said, you know, like you said, like M MRI has downsides in terms of um, um, temporal resolution <coughs> and things like that. Like there's some downsides to using online data things. There's like selection biases. So, you know, uh, the people who want to take online experiments are the kind of people who take the online experiments. And so that means that you might be getting people who self-select to be in your studies. Certainly, you already have this problem, which is an insidious one in general in psychology, which is that you can't compel people to do things they don't want to do, which means that they, uh, they, when they're searching for the different types of things they could do on Mechanical Turk, they're looking for, uh, if they look for psychology experiments, it's it may be because they're interested in psychology, they read psychology on their own, they're sort of interested in science in general or something like that. And so you're getting a self-selection effect where like, it's sort of like people who are interested in, um, in, uh, in, in science. Uh, also, it turns out that, like, it turn that, that it's not very representative of the general population in certain uh, factors, like with regard to like, for example, political orientation. So I guess like 
more people on Mechanical Turk were supportive uh, or self-identified as liberals than conservatives, for instance. Um, and so, um, so there's some uh, concern about doing, for example, like political science research on Mechanical Turk. So people who do that are, uh, when you see these studies actually, they're often reported in the news and they say like, oh, we, you know, we try to study people's attitude about this political issue. We did a quick 100 person survey on Mechanical Turk. You should have like a really big red flag go up in your mind because uh, Mechanical Turk is not a good random sample of political attitudes to evaluate things again. Um, and also it's, it's a little bit dubious about the number of actual people who are using Mechanical Turk as workers. So Amazon uh, just publicizes this kind of like broad number, which I think it was, it used to be 500,000 uh, uh, um, registered uh, Mechanical Turk workers. It's probably gone up from that, but like, um, that, of course, that's a, you know, web companies do that all the time, like how many registered users there are versus how many actually use the system. Uh, some studies have done uh, capture, recapture things where uh, they use it to estimate population size and like um, behavioral ecology thing. Like I, I think the classic example, which I like the idea of, is that you want to find out how many uh, squirrels are running around on Berkeley campus. So you capture a couple of them and you paint their bellies pink and then you let them go and then you come back in a couple of days and you catch them, you catch as many as you can and you find out what, how many of the ones with pink bellies you caught. And you know, if you catch, if you painted all the ones the first day with pink bellies and you caught only ones with pink bellies, you guess that you probably experienced most of the population the first time and so you know that the population's not that big. But if you never capture another pink one, then you should expect that the population is much bigger than the sample that you originally got. And so you can estimate population size that way. And people who have done that by recapturing uh, people who take part in multiple experiments suggest that there's about eight to 10,000 active mechanical turf workers who take part in psychology experiments. So that's not to say that there's a, not a broader set that during machine learning tasks or whatever, but within the context of like what we call maybe psychology experiments, um, there's maybe only about eight to 10,000 users, which is like the size of a large uh, undergraduate uh, psychology major actually in like a Midwest school or something like that, or like a, a large campus. So. Okay, uh, contamination is a problem. Uh, there's this, the workers cross talk each other in uh, forums online uh, talking about your task. Uh, generally people have noticed that they, that some of those are private that you have to kind of like be invited into so you may not know for sure, but um, what they're sharing about your experiments. I, some of them seem to be respectful. I think people generally seem to be respectful of the not telling the trick, if there's an experiment with a trick, like saying what it is, just saying, saying generally whether it was a pleasant experiment or whether it was worth your time or not like that. But uh, certainly there's a problem with repeated presentation of popular paradigms in psychology, right? So I think like uh, some surveys showed that maybe 56% of people had participated multiple times in a prisoner's dilemma uh, or and 30% had experienced the trolley problem, which you know is a problem because like the trolley problem, and if if you kind of like the first time you're presented with the trolley dilemma is the first time that you sort of feel the emotions and weigh it all in your head and evaluate it, but then the second or third time you kind of remember what you thought and you maybe heard some NPR story about it or whatever, and then you like kind of figure out, yeah, I'm a utilitarian versus an emotional responder or something like that, and so you, so those kind of things can be a problem. Uh, if you use a kind of very, uh, what's I call it, like the cognitive psychology, like very traditional experiment design uh, type thing. Um, and Cytric uh, tries to help with some of these things. So some of these things turn out to be technical issues that you can try to address at least a little bit if you have sophisticated web programming tools that prevent people from repeat participation, including maybe even repeat across multiple experiments that are similar to one another, which like Cytric can kind of enable. Um, also, people say that they're like uh, watching TV at the same time, listening to music. 27% are not alone while working on HIT. It's popular amongst parents who are taking care of young children uh, to like make some money on the side. And so as a result, like that can be a distraction. Like so they could be in the middle of your experiment, you know, changing a diaper or something like that. Um, uh, and so uh, one thing that you could like look at is like, you know, record for instance in your data, like how long people take breaks in the middle of a task. Uh, and also, um, you can't really tell like what other people think they're doing. Like you can't like, when you're running a web experiment, you can't see that they have YouTube open or Netflix on or something like that. But you can see uh, window uh, front, what, what windows the focus is, is the focus. So the, it does tell you whether the window that you're uh, currently displaying your web page in is the center focus or not. 
And Scikit tracks that automatically for you. So you can use that as like a covariate potentially of like per exclusion criteria or something like that. You saw people rapidly switching between two different tasks. You might imagine that they're got a notepad open and are taking notes and then switching back and forth between the experiment or something like that. And so in some cases you can get some like little hints if you have sophisticated, um, um, you know, more savvy understanding of web, web delivery and stuff like that, you can kind of deal with that. Um, uh, there's lots of interest in how like the, the data compares to the laboratory studies. So like basically the form of this kind of genre of papers that lots of people uh, do uh, mechanical Turk experiments and then also do them in the traditional laboratory setting and then kind of see how the data compares or maybe you can see, consider how uh, the error bars look different between the different conditions. And I think the general consensus across a pretty broad variety of especially cognitive type experiments, those involving like thinking, reasoning, uh, uh, and things like that are that they replicate relatively well and that like the, that they're, they're in that so for those types of studies maybe there's not a big cost for doing mechanical Turk uh, research but for other things there might be more of a problem. Um, and I think it's all sort of been worked out some of the stuff is a little bit older but like you know IRBs are not very hard to get almost every university has uh, mechanical Turk research going on. Um, I've seen debates about how much you should pay people um, there's a little bit of a disconnect between research uses of, of Mechanical Turk and like what um, uh, IRBs uh, do these th and things. So the workers essentially are being told by Amazon, sign up and do, the, do work online for money, right? And so when they enter the site, that's sort of what their impression is, like I'm doing work for money. But sci sci uh, sci science research is actually not supposed to be like uh, ov overly com uh, compensatory such that it's coercive, right? Like you're not supposed to be able to like make someone do something they wouldn't otherwise want to do by paying them like $10,000, right? And so like, uh, so there's a little bit of a disconnect there. Like we should be paying them sort of just like a little bit of money. Um, there's debates about whether you should even do pay anyone any money, but like sort of like, you know, like, like the, a small amount of money that sort of just as a compensation for their time or maybe their travel costs or something like that. Uh, rather than like as a work kind of thing. So like should you pay someone a minimum wage or like a living wage or something like that. These kind of issues are a little bit tricky. Um, uh, uh, you can, and then other people say like you should just pay whatever the market supports. So if like you want to do your experiment and your experiment takes like two and a half hours and it requires like reading like a novel and then answering questions about it and you want to offer someone 15 cents for it. If someone wants to do that work for 15 cents, then um, you should just like let them do it, right? So, um, so uh, generally, there's a lot of discussions about it. I've even been on grant panels where people have dinged a grant because of the fact that they were overcompensating mechanical Turk workers because uh, they thought that research was not supposed to be uh, overly, com 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 it was an interesting discussion to go through uh, in a panel. But um, so and anyway, there's a, lot, there's a lot that goes into it. We, in, in my lab, just from our experience, we pay people basically what we would pay them in the lab minus like a dollar or two that, that's just the com convenience cost of not having to like travel into the lab. So if we were gonna offer someone $10 on Craigslist to come into the lab or $12 on Craigslist, we might offer them like eight or $9 to do it over the internet. Um, and so we don't, we don't make a big disparity between, or certainly don't wanna set up a situation where there's like second class subjects that are being paid significantly less than ones that would otherwise come into the lab. Um, there's another good reason to be a good requester, which is that um, if your task break, workers will email you and then they share information about good and bad requesters. One of the most famous examples of this is this thing called Turkopticon, which is like a Firefox plugin that sort of like overlays on top of Mechanical Turk. And so then it, it basically provides like almost like Yelp reviews of workers or, or requesters, like how good their tasks are and how timely they are with payment, how fair they are and things like that. And so you can, you can actually, if your lab is one of them you can search through and you can find like your rating of your, um, your lab and you can see that my lab, well, back when we did this was, was rated pretty well. But, but uh, you don't want to be one of these labs that has really bad communication skills and doesn't pay fairly and stuff like that. Um, so some ways of doing that is to like, uh, before you run your experiment, test it on a couple different browsers and be aware of those cross browser issues. I mean, that's a huge problem. I mean, you can talk to web developers, right? And like, this is like a thing where people get paid uh, money and have real jobs, right? Is to solve these cross browser situations. And so it's hard for an individual lab to kind of deal with all those headaches of supporting all different types of uh, browsers. But at the very least useful to know the limits of your experiment. So if your experiment doesn't work in IE, uh, you might wanna um, 
a priori warn people about that and ask them not to take part in it if they're going to be in a browser that won't work. And in fact, Citric has a way of um, detecting the browser uh, at a, and then letting you ex automatically exclude people that, that use browsers that may not work for your, for your setting. Um, uh, uh, and then also, we always find it helpful to like start collecting data in small batches to detect those problems. So a classic thing that's happened in my lab a lot is that a new student will come in and is super excited and it's been working for like a month on programming their JavaScript experiment. They can't wait to get a lot of data. And so they need immediately spin up like a thousand person task all in like one hour. And then they get like hundreds of people come in and the code, the code is broken and everyone then requests like, hey, I want compensation because I did this task and on the last screen it, it crashed my browser, you know, and then it's just a big headache, right? And so the better thing to do is at least kind of like start off with just like three or four people and see if it works okay and if you see any major problems and then as you feel more confident that your code doesn't have a lot of problems then slowly expand out to your uh, pre-set uh, number of uh, subjects that you uh, established with a power analysis. So, um, uh, and then if something goes wrong, it, usually what you do is you provide an alternative payment thing because like if the browser completely crashes or if something just happens to that person like a power outage comes out in the middle of their task we're generally pretty uh, generous about that and like let people uh, get paid for their ta time anyway. Um, and so you can usually, you can create like a, a hit that is only um, essentially like, as, do you give the person over email a special password and then uh, you have, the, you create a hit that only they'll be able to complete because they know the password and basically they just paste this password into the web form and then hit enter. And if you have the right password, it gives you credit for doing the task and if it doesn't, then it says sorry. And so then you, that way you can like identify that one person and create a hit for them and then give them the compensation sort of outside the normal channel. Because otherwise there's no way to like go back. If they don't get to the final phase and say I finished the hit, then there's no way to give them any money basically. There's no way to transfer money to them. So you just have to have an email address and monitor it relatively pretty regularly while you're running Mechanical Turk experiments to like catch these kind of errors and compensate people for their problems. And if you don't, then you'll show up on Turk Opticon as a, as a loser. Okay, so summary from part one, and then we'll take a like little about five uh, minute break or something, like, or a two minute break or something like that. It's just that you know, mechanical trick lets you collect data relatively quickly and conveniently. Web experiments can uh, help prevent uh, experimenter effects and can increase the anonymity of uh, subjects. Many classic findings replicate with pretty good fidelity, actually, but it's important to check for things like browser limitations and check for. Uh, understanding of the task. So that's one thing that we learned in our experiments is that, you know, people don't read the instructions and so you really have to put a lot of effort into making sure the instructions are very clear, they make sense to a broad audience, and then maybe even give comprehension checks to make sure that people understand the instructions before they go into experiment it makes you get much better data. Uh, and uh, it's important to use it in an ethical way. So any uh, questions about that or? Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering about uh, the concentration and engagement hints that you talked about, the window focus thing and yeah. the time on each stage. Um, so have you used those to uh, remove uh, participants, so like people who maybe just did not engage as you wanted to or just were doing other stuff? I think the only place that we've used it, um, used that as an important measure is we've done some um, memory experiments. I feel like that's still a little bit of a uh, uncertain terrain for us, like um, uh, because uh, because people could uh, write things down or like uh, or run a screen capture program or something like that while they're doing the experiment, and then their memory would be way better than what you expect. And so, if you're paying people for memory performance, and then you're giving them a memory task where they have to learn something and hold it in memory, there's a chance that they might sort of subvert it with the computer tools that they have available to them. Oh. And so in those cases, that like for memory experiments, I think is one case where we have looked to see things like focus changing on the study trials and stuff like that to make sure that people weren't like seemingly like right, you know, like we always at the end of a study like that will say, um, just before you submit the hit, did you write down any of the words that we wanted you to learn or whatever? And ask them, honestly, almost like that thing, like when you give blood and they ask like, do you want your blood to actually go? after you give the blood, you know, they may say like, okay, like do you really want the blood to actually go into the blood bank or not? And the idea is like that at the last minute you could opt out without, you know, the embarrassment of going in or whatever. So like we try to do the same thing, like you get to the end, you're gonna get paid, don't worry. Just by the way, like do you want your data to be actually analyzed? We're trying to do this for science and so if you were using a pen and paper or whatever, that's a bad thing. 
So in those cases, we've been much more sensitive about this kind of switching and stuff like that. I think in general, uh, we can see that they're not doing that in other tasks, like decision-making tasks by just the short time span between trials. And it may even be distracting, but we can just look at reaction time and go like, the inter-trial interval is too long. Like if you, if you have to respond, you know, um, and you, the person doesn't respond in time or something like that, and they, they take off for like 30 minutes in the middle of the task, then that's like a good reason to exclude them. You don't even have to look for the focus thing in that case. You just look at your data file and see that there's a really long pause right in the middle. But um, so yeah, so we've used it just in that case. I don't know if other people have used it, but certainly uh, we just added, Citric does it like automatically in the background, so there's nothing that you have to do to actually get that data, and it's always stored with your subject, and so it's always available for you to analyze if you wanted to look at it. Did you have a question? Um, is it pretty flexible when you create a hit um, and letting you restrict you know, a target population? Um, yeah, so the question is, does the mechanical trick let you target particular populations? And um, there is sort of a language that it lets you express for what they call qualifications, which are like are descriptors about the workers that sort of uh, how many tasks they've successfully completed, how much of their work has been paid for. Like if they're maybe a bad worker, they, they might be shunned by many work, uh, of the requesters, and so then you might say, like, I don't want this person, uh, or you might even be suspicious of people who just recently signed up on the site because they're more likely to be bots or something like that, and so there's exclusion criteria that you can put in like that. I've heard that there's some advanced things that let you get into, like, country codes and things like that, um, uh, but um, it doesn't, obviously it's not like, it's not like a complete survey of, of things, right, so it's not gonna, like, screen people based on SES or something like that, right? Because like, they, don't, they don't collect that information about the workers. All they know is like sort of like, basically where they're connecting from sort of based on their, uh, some tax information that they provide. So like they kind of know where the, what country they're in and they know like sort of how well they use the Mechanical Turk system. And those are exclusion criteria you can use, not too much about um, general demographics. In the back there, Just yeah. Just a comment on that. So from experience, I've read a lot of MFS studies. Um, sometimes you can put But what are those, what, like what's an example of one that you have to pay a lot more? I thought that was mostly for like really high quality gold standard workers. So you used like, to be able to pay for, um, I think it's called expert or something like that. You yeah. Sort of sure. You can now pay for all sorts of extra uh, restrictions on population as well. Like uh, gender? Yeah, yeah. So I think most people don't 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 use that stuff, but um, but certainly it's possible. Yeah. Um, okay. Any other things? Well, let's take a one minute break, and we're going to switch to uh, Alex uh, being the, uh, the person. So let's uh, let's see. It's ten eighteen. Let's do a ten twenty, and then we'll uh, switch over.
saving us to you and to Jesus and to them. Um, and now, uh, it should be stuck in the All right, everyone, so uh, I think we're going to uh, get started with a really brief uh, overview. Hey, getting back to getting back to everything here. Um, oh, that worked really well. OK, cool. Um, so, uh, so a lot of you have already used Mechanical Turk, which is great. So I think we're going to make this part really uh, quite brief. Um, but just uh, talk a little bit about what Mechanical Turk looks like and what sort of the options are of how to use it. Um, so, right, if you're being involved in Mechanical Turk, you're basically one of two different populations. You're either a requester who's making tasks or you're a worker who's uh, completing tasks. Uh, so your views in Mechanical Turk uh, are quite different uh, in those two groups. Um, so we're going to look very briefly at you know, what it looks like to use Mechanical Turk as a worker and what it looks like to use it as a requester. Um, and the nice thing is that uh, Mechanical Turk actually uh, has created basically a full duplicate of all of their uh, services from the worker and the requester side so that you can uh, kind of, uh, when you make a task, sort of test it and see how a worker would see it uh, without actually putting it out uh, for people to do for money. Um, so they have this thing called the Sandbox. Um, so instead of going to mturk.com, you could go to uh, either workersandbox.mturk.com or requestersandbox.mturk.com. Um, so if I actually click this here, um, and any of you could go there as well, uh, you have to be signed in with a, an account that is signed up for Mechanical Turk. But uh, here I have this uh, uh, sandbox screen that looks just the same as the real screen, except at the top it just says uh, that I'm going to develop a sandbox. Um, so here I could click uh, the make money uh, half, find hits now. Um, and it's going to take me to the screen that uh, looks just like what a worker would see on the real thing. So uh, we have a whole list of different hits. Um, they each have, uh, maybe I can make this a little bigger. They each have a, uh, a description, the name of it, who the requester is, uh, how much time you would get to do the hit. Um, I think it should say somewhere uh, how much you would be paid for the hit. Yep. Um, and uh, how many uh, hits there are available. So a lot of these hits, you can, you're allowed to do multiple of them. Although often as a psychologist, you only want to let people do, uh, do, it one, do your experiment one time. Um, so uh, actually, when you create a, a, a task before you send it off to the real, um, uh, to be done by real workers, uh, you can send your task out to the sandbox and then go on here uh, and actually search for your hit and find it and per, uh, perform it just the way that a worker would do. Um, so that can be quite useful. All right, and then the requester sandbox. Um, we won't really go uh, too much into this, but uh, you would, if you wanted to create a hit using mechan uh, Mechanical Turk's built-in tools, uh, you could sort of test how this would work at the requester side. Uh, although, in fact, you'll be able to do a lot of uh, uh, the things that a requester has to do just through the Cytrix system without having to go onto this uh, website, except for sometimes if things go wrong, um, like somebody isn't able to successfully complete your hit or something like that. Uh, and then, of course, you can go to the real uh, deal by going to mturk.com. And uh, of course, it looks basically the same, which is the whole point. All right, so uh, as Todd kind of described, a hit uh, is just a human intelligence task. It's one uh, task that you put up for workers to complete. Um, you could have a hit that uh, multiple people uh, can do. So like your experiment, you might say, OK, uh, I'm going to put out a hit with uh, that 20 people can do, those individual 20 things are each called assignments. So it would be a hit with 20 assignments. Um, and so for our experiments, usually the hit is an entire task. But other people, like machine learning researchers, might make uh, one image that you classify would be a hit. And you could go do you know, as many images as you want. So you kind of have options about how to structure your, your hits. Um, so uh, as a worker, you need to you know, sign up for the site, uh, search uh, for hits, and, and complete them. We kind of walk through that. Um, if they uh, don't complete the hit, they can then, so once they uh, accept the hit, they've sort of taken one of the assignments 
Um, and so that becomes sort of locked off. They kind of own it and nobody else can come in and sort of complete it ahead of them. Um, and they kind of have it locked down for uh, up to a certain amount of time. Uh, and then if they either never complete it or just um, uh, decide explicitly to return it, then the assignment will become free again and another worker uh, could take it uh, and complete it. Um, so they go uh, do the task and then they signal to Amazon that they've completed it. Uh, and uh, at some point you as the requester uh, approve their work uh, and then they get the credit for, uh, for that assignment. Uh, so on the mechanical, on the requester side, uh, it's kind of just you know the, re the reverse of that. Um, an important thing here is that you can, uh, there's sort of two ways that you could create hits. You could either use Amazon Mechanical Turk's uh, built-in set of tools where you go into the browser, uh, or you could do a external question uh, approach where you have somebody in Mechanical Turk like uh, basically open the hit and click the link, but then it takes them to another browser page where you can have them do uh, whatever you want, um, which is the approach that SciTurk takes. Uh, so, if you want to uh, use the built-in question template, um, it's you know in many ways quite uh, a lot easier uh, in that uh, at least for people with no coding experience, because you can just sort of go into this GUI and, and kind of type out the questions you want. Um, so, if you just want to do a survey on Mechanical Turk, or if you want to do something extremely static, like uh, you know simply have a static image and ask somebody to type out uh, a label for the image, something like that, uh, then you, you might be able to get everything you need just from the, uh, from the built-in tools. Uh, but as soon as you kind of want to do something that's more interactive, like uh, even just getting reaction time or having people do a lot of uh, button press responses or having anything that's uh, moving around on the screen or has fancy uh, styling, CSS styling, anything like that, um, really any of the interactivity that you expect in a lot of psychology experiments, um, it becomes a lot more difficult to do that with mechanical search built-in tools. Um, and that's when external hits uh, become a lot more, more helpful. Um, right, so can't have dynamic content, um, hard to collect reaction times and things like that. Uh, so external questions give you a lot of freedom, uh, but they also come with some uh, challenges, right? Because uh, now once that person goes into Amazon and clicks that link and sends them to another browser, uh, you're in charge of all that, right? So you need to be, uh, hosting the experiment. Uh, you need a web server running uh, somewhere. Um, you need somewhere to, uh, to store the data after they've, uh, after they've done whatever they have to do uh, for the hit. You have to tell Amazon that they've completed the external hit. Um, and of course, as before, you have to uh, approve the, the hits for completion and you know, deal with workers. Um, Yeah, so, right, so SciTurk uh, basically is built to, to deal with a lot of those problems. So uh, SciTurk serves the experiment, um, uh, su submits the request to Amazon to create that external hit, uh, will securely host the uh, ad, the part that people see within the, the Amazon uh, website, um, then will host the external part that is the actual experiment. Um, SciTurk will uh, send them back to Amazon when they've completed your experiment. Uh, and then we'll also give you tools to really easily and efficiently um, pay, to pay your workers, uh, give them bonuses based on their performance, all these things like that. So that, as I said, you almost never need to actually go into the Amazon uh, website and deal with their uh, somewhat outdated uh, forms. All right, so like I said, we went through that uh, really quick, so now we can get right into the Sector uh, material. Yeah, so, um, uh, so SciTurk, what is SciTurk? So SciTurk is a platform for doing science on Mechanical Turk. The logo here is designed to actually uh, represent the kind of community built aspect of it in the sense that originally it was some haphazard scripts that were developed in my lab for when we started doing Mechanical Turk and then we thought it'd be useful to kind of like co coordinate that a little bit. And then using Git and stuff like that, people have all contributed uh, to the code, like a big community has kind of come up where there's, I don't know, there's like probably 20 or so contributors that have added, you know, bug fixes or substantial feature changes and things like that over time. Um, so how does it work exactly? So the metaphor, so with anything like a tool like this, you kind of don't know you don't need it until you try it, right? So like Jupyter Notebook, it's sort of like, 
I never knew I knew needed a notebook style interface for my data analysis and then someone shows you how cool it is and then you're like, oh, okay, that's exactly, I'll use that now. So like the thing is like, why do you want to use Citrix or something like that? So the example of why I try to give, why people would do it is sort of like this example of like where you have, um, in the old days you had like cassette tapes. Maybe none of you remember what that was like, but it was like an important part of uh, dating in my uh, <laughs> high school years. And so like, uh, you know, you'd make, uh, you have cassette tapes and the things that were cool about cassette tapes is that you would like trade cassette tapes with people and then you could make copies of the tapes because a lot of like tape recorders had like two things in it and like you could transfer the tape from one to the other and it'd make it work. It would sound worse, but you would make the copy that way. And then even better is you can make mixtapes. So like you would, someone who you're interested in, you would like make them a cool mixtape of like music to listen to that was sort of like your playlist or whatever. Um, and then to play the cassette, you need a player device like a Walkman or a Boombox or something like that. And so Sidetrack is meant to be like the Walkman, um, instead of, but instead of playing music, it plays experiments. So it's like a tool that plays experiments, and you can download and install Sidetrack onto your computer. It gives you some command line tools, one of which is the command Sidetrack, uh, and, and that acts like a multi-function player, sort of, that lets you play things. Um, and so figuratively speaking, you can kind of like run, pause, eject, and configure, but in this case, it's experiments rather than tapes. Okay, and then to be useful, you need something that you can actually play, and so you can uh, write your own uh, uh, experiments, but you can also download from what we call the experiment exchange, all the files necessary to kind of run up someone else's experiment. And then you can kind of play them in a relatively straightforward and common uh, workflow um, using the Sidetrack tool. So that way it makes uh, experiments exchangeable between labs in a much more transparent way than is the way it normally works. Um, so, and you can even switch between experiments relatively quickly because like pretty much like you make a folder on your computer that has all the files necessary for like, let's say Alex's experiment. But then if you have another experiment you want to run, you just sort of like quit Sidetrack, move into that other folder and start it up in that folder and then it will be running that experiment. And so like you kind of can switch even on like your local computer really quickly between uh, different, ex um, different experiments, just like you would switch tapes out of your, your Walkman. Um, but even better is that you can um, make your own experiments by remixing others. So the idea is that all the code on the experiment exchange is open source and so you can download uh, the uh, code for it and edit it and change it. And so the idea would be that like a student who's moving into a new area or maybe a, even a research group that wants to try to like uh, build on something that someone else has done, you might go to the experiment exchange, identify an experiment that's kind of similar to what you want to do. Maybe it's similar in the sense of it being a similar behavioral task and you just wanted to add some additional conditions to it or change some, some substantive thing about it. Or maybe it's more that you like the look and feel and design of that particular experiment and you could see how you could adapt it for your type of design. The idea is you could get the code for it and then kind of like be able to deconstruct the way the person made that experiment and relatively easily bootstrap your own thing. So it's sort of the formalization of this, the, the informal email network that already exists where you would email an author of a paper and say, hey, could I have access to your experiment code? And uh, more and more people are being uh, cooperative about that and would share it. Um, and so, the, but the goal of Sidetrack was basically, uh, from our perspective, was that uh, we didn't, uh, so that the students in the lab uh, and the people who are doing the heavy lifting on the research had more time to spend on the important part of their actual behavioral research, which is designing the actual task and the workflow in which the person is actually interacting with, and not so much on like web technology. Because it's like, there's a lot of things that go into like uh, delivering an experiment, setting up a web server, setting up a database, dealing with like these JavaScript tricks and stuff like that. And it was like a lot for someone to like come in who doesn't necessarily know that much about that. It's not part of standard undergraduate psychology training and things like that to know that stuff. So we want to like make it so that you don't have to think about all that stuff. And in fact, um, you just get this tool and it provides most of those functions for you. And so then that way you have more time to focus on your actual experiment and your data analysis and your plan for data collection and things like that. And um, I guess uh, the uh, important thing that we've learned, maybe that we didn't anticipate that this being true, but it's ended up being relatively useful, is that um, rel like so. I want to say like the the side trick is it, you can you can you can put something like side trick against the standard way of people doing even mechanical trick research. So many labs have like uh, constructed a workflow within their lab for how they conduct mechanical trick research. Basically, like you guys, many of you have all already done it before. You probably have something that's either uh, you like maybe you're using just like Qualtrics or something like that, which is relatively straightforward. But if you have something more sophisticated in your lab, you probably had some people uh, cook up some specific platform for you. And the problem with that is that you, that that if, if I were to go to ask you like how can I replicate your experiment, 
you would probably send me a really long email being like, okay, you put this CGI script in this folder and you need a server that can run the CGI script and then you, after it's done, then you type this script and then it like outputs the data and then you do this and then it's like, a, it's not a very common workflow. And so that would, you have to like, oh, that's, I, I would have done that, okay, I'll understand that. And you have to like learn again every single time you want to try to do something where it seems kind of pointless that everyone has their own cooked solution for this kind of stuff. And that, and then the other side of it is that like, uh, as a good example, somewhere in SciTurk was at one point using that qualifications thing that you talked about to uh, restrict uh, access to only US uh, workers. And someone noticed that there was a bug in that uh, code actually, and then fixed it on the SciTurk master branch, right? Um, and then that meant that that uh, fix was propagated out to all the SciTurk workers or all Sartic, Sartic users so that they got the advantage of that uh, bug fix. And you can imagine that like, that's sort of our fault, we shouldn't have made that bug, but individual labs can make bugs like that really easily. But there's no way for anyone to, one, catch them, and two, share that fix out to everybody, right? And so something about centralized tools for this and common workflows is really important in this domain. It's also important for like, you know, we were saying like one of the great things about these things like our markdown, and uh, Jupyter Notebook is the replicability of your analysis and the, the tight coupling between your analysis workflow and your graphs and so forth so you can share that with someone and they can recreate your analysis. But we should take that same approach to the design of our experiments and SciTrick is an attempt to try to formalize that, that, that kind of idea. Okay, so the architecture consists of, like I said, the command line tool. Um, it's a little archaic relative to the, today's uh, you, you know, it's not like an iPhone app you download and configure. It's like a command line tool that you have to type some things at. We did that partly just because that was, we didn't know what all features we, that Citric was going to need to have. And so it's easier to add new commands to a command line than it is to redesign a user interface every time that you realize that you were thinking about it wrong. And so a command line is sort of a lightweight way of kind of being able to play in a domain and maybe that will change over time. Uh, and then it also has some cloud-based services. So Citric.org runs this like thing which is called an ad server for relatively technical reasons. I don't remember if I'll go into them, but, um, and, and also Sectric.org, for instance, hosts the experiment exchange system, which provides a system for sharing experiments between people. So let's like talk a little bit about the workflow that a, a person experiences while they're using Sectric. So we're thinking about the crowd as like the, the general internet population, the mechanical Turk workers who are like um, out there wanting to do tasks for money on mechanical Turk. So what they would do, Typically, is they're going to like go to the mturk.com website as a worker, as Alex just showed, and they're going to like see the different tasks that are available, and they're going to actually, when they click on the hit, they're going to it's going to pull up like a kind of iframe, uh, which is a you know web page embedded inside a web page that sort of like will show uh, some details about the task. Sometimes people make that just the entire experiment right there, uh, but other times people make that sort of be more like. Uh, what I think of is like, a, like the ads that you see posted on campus for experiment, you know, like the little things that come into the lab and take this experiment, there's little tab, tear off tabs so that you can like get the email address of the experimenter or whatever. So it's sort of like an ad that describes like, if you do this task, this is what's gonna be involved, this is how long it's gonna take, you know, this is who we are, we're researchers from uh, UC Berkeley or whatever, we're like trying to like do, do this, and so like it gives the, the subject some kind of information about opting in. Uh, and it, but it turns out that, uh, yeah, and so then for uh, more complicated external hit designs, it would mean that you would probably have some kind of dedicated servers, like you would have uh, like, a, like a web server in your lab or something like that, or you'd use university hosting for your, your thing, or maybe even like you, some people would use Dropbox or something like that to serve up the web pages. So instead of that, what Scitric does is like turns your local computer, whatever machine you're running Scitric in, into a little web server. So you don't have to like go install and set up a web server. The, the tool includes a web server sort of in it, like a little web application server. And so when you use SciTurk, if I type SciTurk on this laptop, it turns SciTurk and this turns this laptop into a web server temporarily. Not a super fancy, powerful one, but enough of one to like run a couple people at a time. Um, and so then, it, what it also does is that you you post like sort of the tech when you create a hit to advertise your task, you post a, an advertisement to scitrick.org, like the cloud, which in the, the advertisement is basically like, exactly like I said, like the one that's hand, hung up on campus and just describes in broad sense who you are, how long the task will take, things like that. Um, and then um, what happens is then is that the, when the crowd uh, connects to mturk, in that little iframe, they actually view uh, the, the ad that you posted on the scitrick.org cloud. Uh, and uh, and because and, so your laptop posts it to the cloud, the cloud serves it up as the first thing that the person sees. 
And then uh, they click an OK button, like, yes, I'd like to do this. It pops up a new window on their computer, like a new uh, uh, browser tab or whatever. That then is now communicating directly to your laptop or whatever, whatever server device you have it set up on. And so at that point, um, the Scikit Cloud doesn't see your data, doesn't know what your task is about or anything like that. All you posted to, uh, to Scikit was just a little bit of text describing what your experiment is about. That's the opt-in advertisement for the person who's the worker, like what they want to collect. And then after that, it starts, uh, your data passes back and forth, however you decide to design that sort of with the, to the from your, you know, they can talk directly to your laptop, basically. Um, and uh, I guess like one advantage of this, the, the one advantage of the secure ad server is that, um, well, first off, there's a technical issue, which is that unless you can sign uh, your, the first page view that you give to Mechanical Turk with SSL, uh, or you make it have HTTPS, then it won't load correctly on the Amazon website because there's a thing called mixed content blocking, which most browsers institute now that like basically prevent, it, it, it's confusing to like um, see the little lock symbol. It, it, expect, when you go to mturk.com, you get a little lock because it's like a secure website, but it, it's not fair if the if embedded in that website is another website that's not secure, it gets confusing like which one you're, what, which, what you are. So they as a policy, they just don't show the content of any of the things when that lock is visible. And so because the lock is visible on the mturk.com, it won't show any of the subpages. And that can be turned out like SSL signing, generally not that big of a deal and people are getting, there's like tools and software that's getting a little bit easier for it, but it's sort of a hassle in the university. Like university will do a lot of stuff, like uh, NYU, uh, obviously the, the IT department here did all this cool stuff with setting up uh, servers and stuff like that. But the, um, uh, I, my experience is that they'll tell you, for, forget it on SSL certificates. They just won't give you one because it like um, and so as a result like at least the, not the not the one from like NYU.edu or something like that. So as a result, our system kind of like provides a workaround for almost everyone who has that problem by posting your thing on the. It just provides that little snippet of text and it signs it securely so you don't have to deal with this mixed content thing. One upside is that like it actually records some useful information, provides that to you about things that happen, statistics that might happen that are sort of before a person enters in your experiment, like. How many people looked at your ad for your experiment but then decided not to do it? Like Google Analytic type things like that, right? Like so like you, could, you might find out that like there's a lot of people on Mechanical Turk who are looking at your, your ad and then deciding after they see the text of it and seeing what university you're from or something like that are deciding not to do the task. So it kind of, that's one nice thing is it records like geographic location and that's also the place in which you can block workers so you can tell them um, you can, that's where Scytrix logic steps in and, and will say you're using IE7 uh, our experiment won't run correctly on that. Please download a more modern, up-to-date up server or whatever. And so it, it, it steps in at that phase, right before they even get anywhere into the task, it steps in and would say, sorry, your browser is the wrong one. Or it can, and at that point, it also says, you've already done this type of task before, so please don't take part in it again. So that's the advantages of it. So to install Scikit, you need um, like a kind of Unix type environment. OS X and Linux works pretty good. Windows is not supported. Um, uh, locally on your computer, but you, know, you can use Windows obviously if you do this kind of the way that we've been doing the sessions today where you have kind of an off, off uh, server node someplace that you can SSH to or something. Uh, it depends on Python. Uh, so if you want to install it on your local computer, although the nodes that we're going to be playing with today already have Scytrick installed and actually it's a, it's, it's a package that's really easy to install just like Jupyter Notebook or something like that. So it's just the, you can install it with pip or um, uh, um, or other like apt get and stuff like that. So you can, you can install it on your local computer, but you won't have to for today, so we won't go into the installation process. You'll, you'll already have it installed on this little computer. So uh, the command line features like sort of like three kind of things. Like one is the experiment server, like I said, so you, when you start the command line, nothing really happens, but then when you type a certain command server on, it turns on the web server on your little local computer and it means people can start taking part in your experiment. And then there's a command line shell. The command line shell lets you type commands, that is, some of which interact directly with Amazon and talk to Amazon without you having to go to the Amazon web page. So there are commands like create hit, which will create a hit on the Amazon website. There's ones that will like check balance, that will like check your available balance right now. There's um, uh, uh, how much money you have uh, stored in Mechanical Turk. There's things that like uh, check on the status of individual workers. You can, so you can basically do a lot of the things that you would otherwise be doing in the GUI interface for Mechanical Turk in a rather effortful, effortful way with like relatively simple commands that you can use to check things and we tend to find that a little bit easier. 
Uh, and uh, you can launch and debug your code and through the interactive shell. We'll show some of those tools in a second. And then it also provides like a kind of um, JavaScript library which provides some common uh, experiment functionality, including the ability to like uh, save the data that you're accumulating as you go through the experiment. Um, uh, and like I said, like log window changes and refreshes and stuff like that. So all that stuff kind of comes with the tool by itself. So uh, let me look at, just send you to the website real quick. So this is the Scituric website. Um, this is, uh, it's a quick start guide actually that's sort of useful if you're back at home and you're not sure where to start. It has like a set of steps to get started relatively quickly. There's documentation here and if you click the, uh, on the full docs here, read the docs.org. Uh, relative to most open source software, we put a lot of time into making sure that the documentation is relatively well, well maintained. So the, um, when people make feature requests, we tend to make them and also make a change to the documentation to reflect that. And so the documentation is actually pretty good for an open source project. Like there's, it tells you lots of details and people add tips and tricks for using Scituric in non-standard environments. So we kind of envisioned it like you're running it on your laptop and that's kind of how we do it. But you could run it on, um, uh, I think people have techniques for running it on Amazon Cloud or, um, the Red Hat, Red Hat Cloud or, and, and like OpenShift and other things. And so people have all kinds of tools for, and tricks for using it in different environments that you can read about on the documentation. Um, and it has step-by-step -step guides for everything and whatnot. Um, and then um, here's the experiment exchange. So these are all the, there's like, so I think there's like 15 experiments that have been updated now. There's probably more over time. I think there's a big lag between the time at which people use Scituric and then potentially publish their experiments because they wait until their paper gets accepted. And so, you know, when papers take a year, a year and a half to get published sometimes, then it take a long time for people to feel comfortable sharing their code. But there's a lot of great experiments here. There's really simple examples like Stroop experiments, which we'll kind of step through, but much more complicated ones as well, like that my lab has used. There's ones on decision making. There's like this one, uh, one that Alex did of mushroom foraging, that's really fun. Um, there's people that have done electrical decision. Jess has a mental rotation experiment. Um, there's things on scalar implicatures. Uh, so there's a lot of already, a lot of examples using what, that you can download and get the whole code for. And a lot of these are, in a lot of cases, these are actually published experiments so that you can go also check the original reference for the publication and get the, and see the code and, and step through. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the website. So, uh, what we're going to do actually now is kind of show you uh, an example of using a, 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 a Scituric uh, in the, the advantage of the experiment exchange. So um, like I said, it's sort of like an app store for online experiments. You can download things relatively easily um, and share best practices. So here's an example. Like, so if you, what, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to start up in the background one of these experiments and then we'll collect some data. And then maybe at the end of the session today, we'll be able to look at what data we got because it takes a little bit of time for people to actually complete things. But just to show you, so there's this experiment that we made called Draw Together. It's a really simple experiment where uh, it's not really even like a behavioral experiment, just workers are told, uh, they're given a, a box where they can draw with their pen and we ask them to draw their best impression of an alien. And you know, there's like classic, uh, this is a classic task actually of trying to show the limits of human creativity because almost everyone draws like an alien that looks like a canonical alien. It says like draw whatever alien you think of the most creative alien you can possibly draw and everyone draws like a big bobble headed alien with like a big eyes, right? Um, and so, uh, except for me who I, I drew a uh, amoeba. That's like probably what aliens are. Um, but uh, so this experiment, we'll spin it up and we'll ask a bunch of workers really quickly while we're doing this to like draw some aliens and we'll look at what aliens they draw. But just to show you an example of how quickly it is, to, how quickly you can get into doing a mechanical Turk experiment. Um, and so, are you going to do this? Yeah. Or, yeah, to do it from. Uh, okay. All right. So, uh, in a in a little while, we're all going to um, uh, be doing uh, an experiment on your own computers, uh, right? But for now, I'm just going to sort of walk through. Uh, setting it up on, we're going to set it up back on our lab server um, so that we can actually really uh, easily do it live to, uh, to Mechanical Turk and have everything connected to our account. Um, so first I have to connect to this here so that I'll be connected to NYU's system.
Um, so first let me open up. OK, so we've got draw together here. So we can see on the uh, bottom of each uh, page in the experiment exchange, there is a, uh, a little single line of code that is what you uh, enter in to uh, pull the experiment down from the exchange. So I'm going to go uh, up here. I've opened up a, a terminal window uh, on our uh, lab server. Uh, I'm just going to use uh, this command here to open the kind of persistent window so that if we close it, we can get back to it. Um, so I'm going to go into my uh, documents here. And I'm just going to print that line. And let's see if it pulls in. All right, so it says experiment downloaded into the uh, draw together folder. Uh, type CD draw together and then sidetrack to open it up. So um, draw together. Uh, so if I do side check here, let's see what happens. You have to add a file. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we, we open up side check. Um, but actually, as Todd uh, just uh, mentioned, I have to exit. And so you can almost run it without doing any changes. The only thing you do have to change is you have to tell the file uh, what the host, what your computer uh, you're using is. So um, I'm going to go edit. Uh, there's a config.txt file in the uh, root directory of any sidetrack project. And we're all going to go through this together in a couple minutes. Um, and it has all the configurations for the experiment. So it has the name, descriptions. Um, uh, I want to get given people a real email address to, to use. It's a, now you guys can all email the lab. All right. Um, name is, I'll change this as well. Right, so there's a couple of things that you have to sort of customize. All right. And all right, so the host actually we've set already. Um, so if you use 0.0.0.0, it actually kind of automatically uh, looks up the real IP address of every computer, of whatever computer you're using. So that's like a, a nice uh, trick. Um, and then I'm not sure if that port will work, so I'm going to switch this port to 5000. Um, and I think that should be everything we have to change. All right. So now, if I open up SciTurk, um, uh, we see we're on uh, uh, the 2.1. We're not quite on the latest version, but we're pretty close. It tells, it tells you what the latest version is. Um, you see a little command prompt where it gives you some helpful information. So it tells you um, whether the server is on or off. If the server is off, we haven't turned it on yet. Uh, it tells us whether you're in sandbox mode or live mode. So right now, uh, you start in sandbox mode, meaning every hit you create is going to go to that fake worker sandbox where uh, uh, you know, the workers aren't real and the money uh, isn't real. Uh, and it tells you how many hits you have running. Uh, so that tells me how many sandbox hits I have going on right now. Um, so we can tell that it's, it we're in the sandbox because if we type um, AMT balance here, uh, it tells me that we have $10,000 uh, of money, which is what it always says in the sandbox because it's not real money. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of different commands in SciTurk. Probably, I guess the one that you really need to know to start is that there's a help command. So if you type help, um, we get a list of uh, the commands. So there's a bunch of uh, SciTurk commands that you can use um, that we'll talk about a few of them. Uh, and there's also a few commands that kind of just come with the command line utility. Um, so for example, if I type uh, help uh, mode here, It'll say mode control, uh, command controls whether you're uh, uh, in sandbox or live. So you can type mode live or mode sandbox to go to either mode, or simply type mode to switch between sandbox and live. Um, so for now, uh, we're going to use the server command uh, and type server on. And now, that's good. Let's try it again. All right. So you know, it works the second time, which is nice. Um, so usually it's kind of the first thing you want to uh, check before putting an experiment live is uh, you want to you know, make sure everything's working. So I'm going to use the debug command. I'm going to do a dash uh, P to, tell, to just print out a link that I can use uh, for print. Uh, if you just type debug, it'll uh, pop open a browser on that computer, which is great if you're doing it on your laptop, but we don't want the, the browser to open up on our server. Um, so now if I copy that link in here, uh, we get this. All right, so in this task, you'll be simply asked to draw your most creative and interesting example. Category will be on the next page. Draw your best alien. Um, 
So I'm going to imagine that there's like an alien that uh, looks just like Earth cows, just by weird convergent evolution. Um, so that Pablo thinks I drew a unique alien and not just drawing a, a standard one with antenna. All right. And then <laughs> uh, I'm done. And instead of this was a real hit, it would have uh, saved your uh, hit and, and submitted it to Mechanical Turk. All right, so the debugging seems to work. And so now, usually what you really should do is uh, create a hit in, um, in the sandbox and then go and complete it as a sandbox program and make every, sure everything works. But since we've done this a few times before, we're confident that this is going to work all right. So I'm going to go straight into, hmm? Not that confident? <laughs> well, well, that's why we have the email address. So if it doesn't work, people will email us and complain and we'll pay them that way. Um, so instead, I'm going to go straight into uh, creating the hit. Do you remember how much we pay people for this? A dollar, OK, 50 cents. I think 50 cents seems funny <laughs> um, for drawing a little picture. All right, so we're going to do hit uh, create. So oh, I am in sandbox mode. So if I type mode, it'll say uh, switching mode required to be starting the server. Yes. All right, so let's say I've forgotten exactly how to order the uh, commands for, for hit. So I could type help hit, and it says uh, hit create uh, number of workers, uh, and then reward, and then duration. So I can just put in how many workers I want, the amount of reward, and then the duration. Although actually, I think if I just type hit create, it'll prompt me for all three of those. All right, so let's do like 10, five people. So we'll do uh, five participants, uh, 50 cents for each of them. And uh, we usually just give people plenty of uh, time to do the hit. There is uh, a point where like, it will expire if they haven't done it quickly enough. Um, but I'll give people uh, 30 minutes uh, to complete it, which should be uh, more than enough time. All right, so now it says there's an add URL where people uh, are working on it. And um, so now if we type uh, hit uh, status, I think, it should show us, uh, or hit list active. All right, now we see that there's a hit called draw together, super easy and fun. Uh, its status is Unassignable, which I mean, I think means already five people have grabbed this because people are really, really quick. I think they might have scripts running that automatically like grab new hits that appear. Um, and here's the hit ID, and we see there's max five, and five of them are pending. They're out, you know, being worked on. And when we uh, created it, all right. So now we're just kind of, kind of uh, sit back. The computer is, you know, doing all the work for us. We don't have to shake hands with participants, and uh, we'll kind of see what happens uh, in a little while. You gonna take over? Sure. Cool. Okay. So I guess the, the main point of that little exercise was one to show you the full workflow, but also to show you like how we went and if you thought of that as being an interesting experiment. We're sort of like replicating that interesting experiment in like a minute or two of time, right? Like we just you type a command, you type a couple of things, and all of a sudden you have a web server up and you're running that experiment and collecting data in it on a live Mechanical Turk hit right there. And that extends to all the experiments that are already there, but then you know, if, as more people use it, the more of these things will be available and so people can uh, be able to uh, um, do this kind of thing relatively quickly. So, um, um, I guess now might be a good step to try to log into the little s the servers that everybody has. Although I'm not clear on the instructions for that. So does that, uh, I think you just go to the, the IP address that you were given. But do we have an IP address? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I guess it was in the, the Slack channel, but I don't have it open here.
So is everyone able to go? Are you guys faster than me? Maybe you should put a little the red thing up if you uh, are having trouble getting access to this. Okay, so does everyone have a, a folder like this empty? I guess you'd be in the at the top level here. It looks like this. Has everyone got a, got into a, a node like that? Okay, good. Um, so uh, let's uh, create a new uh, terminal. So just like we've done in the past, you get a new terminal here. Um, Okay, so um, just to check that it's installed, type which SciTurk, and everyone should have access to it. That means that SciTurk is actually installed. Okay, so um, it turns out that there's one command that uh, we have, like SciTurk actually kind of like includes internally without even going to the experiment exchange, like one kind of default experiment. Uh, and so if you want to check that experiment out, you can just type SciTurk-setup-example. Uh, and if you run that, then it will uh, create a folder on your computer uh, in that in the current directory called SciTurk uh, dash example um, with a default configuration file. And so and then if you cd SciTurk example and do ls uh, minus la, you can see the different uh, files that that uh, that appear here. And so that's th this is the this is the basic structure that all internal SciTurk experiments roughly have. And so uh, now that you have one here, uh, I was going to just uh, have you uh, step through a little bit some of the, the files that appear, so that you can kind of understand uh, what their their purpose is. So like um, every every project has a config.txt file, uh, and the configuration that config.txt file contains the configuration options for the, the current hit. And you kind of saw like Alex, was, that was the thing that Alex edited to customize it for his own purposes. So these things include, if we like take a look at uh, one of them, um, uh, it includes things like at the top, it includes the title of the hit. So like when the hit gets posted on Mechanical Turk, there's usually like a little title string. So you could make that be whatever you want it to be. In that one case, it was draw together, it could be Stroop task. There's a description, um, uh, which is like to uh, judge the color of a series of words. There's an AMT keyword, so Amazon Mechanical Turk like, likes keywords when you post a hit that says like different uh, uh, um, things about the experiment. Um, US only is a flag that you can set to true that will limit it to the US only participants. Approved requirement is the thing that says that uh, it limits the the hit to workers who have in the past been a, had successfully approved for 95% of the hits that they've completed. Um, and so that gets like workers who might not like, it's a pretty standard setting that people use sometimes to try to make sure that you don't get uh, bots who might be disapproved a lot. Like so if someone has a 50% approval rating or something like that, you might be suspicious about whether they're a true worker and so forth. So you get, a, you get to enter in your email address uh, for uh, for who to contact when there's a problem. It's sort of the email address that's given to the worker. That's one that you would set up for your, for your lab or something like that to handle problems. Uh, and then there's some side trip things like your, the organization name, your university. Um, and then there's this thing called browser exclude rules. And so that excludes certain browsers. And there, there's a couple, in the documentation, it gives you the full list of strings. They're a comma separated list, but it can, you can type MSIE that will get rid of all Internet Explorer. And then you can also get rid of like mobile and tablet uh, browsers. So like any browser that correctly identifies itself as being a mobile phone browser or a tablet browser, you can basically just add that to that string and it will show them a, a courteous message that says, uh, thanks, we want you to do this on a proper a computer rather than on, a, on an iPad. Um, and so those are like things that you can configure in this config.txt file. Uh, then there's, uh, some things that apply to the database. So uh, SciTurk is pretty flexible about where you place your database. So the couple options are, um, you can use this, this system called SQLite, which is like a SQL database system that runs as a, as a local file in your folder. Uh, and that's what we're using here. So SQL, it's set to be SQLite participants.db. That just means it will write all the data to a local file disk right here. It turns out that's not 
technically an ideal situation because there can be uh, uh, conflicts of read-write when the people are running in parallel, and that could cause some problems. It, it happens pretty rarely, but it's like possible to happen. So a more common approach is to use like a MySQL database or Postgres or something like that. So if you have a MySQL database that's accessible in some anywhere on the internet, you can basically put that string and the login information available for that in that. Uh, URI, URI for that uh, database URL, and you can then access your uh, your remote MySQL database. So it's up to you how you want to structure your databases. Uh, and then there's server stuff that determines like what port your little local server runs on, um, uh, and things like that, like um, that uh, that are useful. So basically, you just uh, can you can configure all these different options for your HIP. Uh, and that's what the config.txt is. And so there's a different config.txt for every, uh, every possible experiment. Um, if you're using SQLite, you'll have a file in your archive once you start running it that's in that folder that's called participants.db, and that's where all the data from the participant actually taking part in the experiment gets written. So it's like your, your log of your experiments. Um, and we'll talk about processing data out of that in a second. And then, uh, so the server.log is just like error messages that the server might generate. That file may not appear when you first check out a project, but gets automatically created when you actually run uh, Scikit-Scikit-Learn. Uh, and then there's a big, there's one folder that's always there. There's two folders. There's one called templates and one called static. So the templates are um, HTML files that you might uh, present to people during the course of the experiment. Um, and they're templates because they can be kind of configured in certain ways, like by the server. But the most cl classic, the most typical one is the, or most important one is that almost all of them have like exp.html, which is like the experiment, the starting place for the experiment. Um, you can put other full files in there if you want to, uh, but basically this pulls in everything else and it's kind of the entry point for participants who are actually taking part in the experiment where you put all your HTML file. We'll look at that in a second. And then static is the thing that includes all the files that are not going to be processed dynamically. Um, so it includes things like um, uh, images uh, uh, that you might want to be showing people, uh, cascading style sheet things that change the look and feel of the web page, the color of the fonts, and so forth. And then JavaScript files that might be in libraries that you might depend on to like uh, change the, the look of the web page dynamically. Uh, so those are the, the, the main things that you have to include. So experiment.html, almost all of them look like something like this. Like they're just a regular HTML page. It has a, a head section uh, that uh, has a couple of unique things in it. The most important things that are in there are this, um, these three variables that are template variables, which are um, unique ID, which is the unique ID of the subject that gets passed from the site trick process. The ad server location, which is the location of your ad when it gets, which is kind of like constructed by the site trick process. And then the mode is if running live or in sandbox or something like that. And so almost all of them, all experiments, you, they, they will, they'll come with this already set up, but it's just an important thing to include, not to edit in your experiment.html if you want it to work properly with, uh, with Scitric. And then it includes Scitric.js as one of the dependencies here. You can include other things, but Scitric.js provides some J JavaScript library functions that are useful for interacting with the Scitric server, most specifically for saving data. So like as you're going through your experiment, you can make uh, calls that will save your data incrementally uh, as you go through. So that as the subject going through, like maybe they could do 10, every 10 trials, you could like save the data that they've done so far back to the server. And that way you can get partial data in case a problem happens uh, somewhere in later in the experiment, you'll get like the data that they did so up to that point where the problem came up. And then task.js is the like actual logic of the experiment in this case. And so this, this demo, that simple setup example is like a little stroop experiment. And so the task.js like controls all the logic for basically making a little um, stroop experiment, which is you know one where they word different words and you have to respond to the color of the font and not ignore the word itself. And often there's interference where you uh, are slow whenever the word, uh, the word that's written doesn't match the color. Uh, okay, so that's the inside of a project. Style sheets, um, it's probably beyond the scope of what we can talk about today to just go into the details, but the style sheet like kind of defines the look and feel of your web page, the fonts and so forth. You can usually copy those from other experiments that you like on the experiment exchange if you like the look and feel of those things and you, that way you can um, bootstrap off of what they've already done. And then task.js is, the, uh, is the, the logic. So the JavaScript API that Scitric provides, scitric.js is like a little library that, that does a couple things 
free, like one, one thing it does is like preload images. So like it has some stuff, like right when it starts up, all the images that are in your folder, if there's a, it'll try to preload them so that you don't access them one by one. That's kind of helpful because if you're having an experiment where you're having people make like reaction time judgments and you're trying to like, you know, show them a picture and then have them make a response, if that image has to load across the network connection, it can actually be delayed rather significantly from the onset of the trial. And so it's useful to kind of preload the images into the browser uh, cache so that like it will, it will essentially be reloaded from within the browser instead of across the network connection. And so like Scikit kind of helps you do that. Of course, um, preloading in browsers is a, is a request, not a command, because it depends on how much memory is available in the browser and stuff like that. So you can't always guarantee that like a really huge number of images will be successfully loaded in advance. But if you have a small number of images, it's usually possible to like preload them all into like a local cache memory and then that way they'll display relatively quickly. Um, and then just by including that JS, .js at the top of your file, it automatically sets up a bunch of JavaScript triggers that start re recording if the wor worker resizes their window, if they switch to another window or tab, and, and is, in store, is gonna store that as part of their data stream automatically. Those are those things that I was saying. So just by including that line that said uh, JavaScript source equals uh, uh, Sidetrack.js, it starts recording that stuff in the window uh, in the background. Um, so to, to use the, the uh, Sidetrack.js, you basically, uh, in the task.js file that, that we had there, there's a couple of key parts. And it, first, it creates a new Sidetrack object with the three template variables that we got, which were unique ID, add server location, and load. Uh, and these just basically tell Scikit the, the necessary information so it knows where to save the data when you request that it saves the data. It kind of tells you the location of your actual web server, basically, and how to get back to your computer. So if, this, if, if we had it running on this laptop, it sort of tells the JavaScript browser where to save the data, which computer on the internet is, is running the server. And then um, you can also, uh, Scikit has some counterbalancing uh, libraries inside it, or essentially like it has a counterbalancing algorithm it's actually not ideal how it works exactly, but it, it basically tries to, um, uh, mean, as you go through the experiment, you have this problem with online experiments of dropouts, right? So if you randomly assign people to conditions one by one, um, you can be like, you know, the first person is condition A, and this person's condition B, and then A and B, and A and B. You won't find out maybe for 30 minutes whether the person, that first A person will successfully complete the hit, right? Because they might like get halfway in and decide I don't want to do it, or maybe they'll just grab the hit and sit on it and then never complete it. And so as a result, you know, you might find out 30 minutes later that the first A was not actually completed and so the cell numbers can become in, unbalanced, right? Because it, it's like, even though you're doing random assignment alternating between people, you have this problem that like maybe one of the cell counts gets low. So Scikit's algorithm kind of looks at the count numbers and sets a lockout window of like 30 minutes or something like that and says like, okay, uh, ignoring the last 30 minutes, like how many people are in each of the conditions and then it tries to put the next person, assign the next person into the condition that has the least number of subjects in it. So it means that all the conditions are filled in roughly about the same amount. Now that can be, some, there can be some problems with that because of uh, if they're like, for instance, uh, dropout rates that vary across conditions that have to do with the difficulty of the condition, then you can have things where you uh, keep assigning people into condition A and they keep failing to complete it. So you have to kind of check your dropout rates across conditions uh, when you're using the algorithm. But basically, you can, you can, if you want to, you can get, you can choose to get the counterbalancing algorithm from within Scikit, or you can just choose a simple random assignment, just flip a coin and choose what condition you want that subject to be in. But you kind of set that up at the very beginning, like what condition does this person belong to? And then recording data is as simple as this. So there's two different uh, re data re recording uh, trials. So like in your JavaScript, you would write like a function here, which is called record trial data, and you basically give it a list. And anything you decide that you can put in there, like and it can be strings, it can be numbers, um, it can be whatever you want. You can just basically put those into those columns and you decide what the columns will be in your spreadsheet sort of, you know, so it's sort of like you might put, uh, if you're adopting like a tidy type representation, right, you would, have a descriptor that's like the, um, uh, of what was displayed on the trial, like on a Stroop experiment, it'd be like what word was presented, what was the color of the word, maybe like what condition that trial was in, what was the reaction time, what was the key press the person made, and so forth. And you just call this line to like essentially save the, a line to your data file each time. Now that doesn't actually push the data to the server, so if the browser were to crash, uh, it would lose that data. 
this just like basically kind of appends it to the internal representation of the data file. There's another type of data that's called unstructured data that, that just is a key value pair. So you can just put in like age 28. Sometimes we have that for like uh, questions in a form like afterward. You can have another type of data file that, that doesn't have columns. It's just like key value pairs uh, that you might want to include. But those are just two functions that are provided to you by the Citric library that you can use throughout your experiment to like save data. And then when you want to actually synchronize the data with the server, you just type experiment save data. You can do that repeatedly. Like you can do it once every trial or once every 10 trials or just once at the end of the experiment. And what it does is it just like, this thing keeps a running tally of all the data that's been recorded so far and save data just sort of like writes it across the internet to the, to the Citrix server and like actually lets it write, write the data to the disk, basically. So you just kind of alternate basically to use Citrix uh, as a data saving thing because you know JavaScript doesn't have a way to open a, a file on the user's computer. Right, so there's no way for you to save data locally necessarily. There's a couple of tricks you can do to do it, but mostly you can't really save data to that person's computer. You wouldn't want it on their computer anyway because then you can't analyze it. You have to have some way of kind of like opening files and writing, and that's what Citric.js basically provides for you. Just some simple commands for uh, recording data and saving it across the server. So there's an API reference on the Citric documentation that goes through all the different things that you can do. Um, there's things like uh, you can, um, one thing that people don't, uh, some people who use Citric that maybe here don't, don't realize that this is a design feature that sometimes people don't use is that there's a command called Citric finish instructions, which is the concept behind that was that um, it's okay from our perspective if a subject were to reload their browser window. So usually a reload on a JavaScript thing might start the, reload, might start the whole JavaScript script over again. And you wouldn't want that to happen if they had already been exposed to your treatment manipulation. Right, like in the sense of like, uh, you know, you, you maybe you might give some instructions and then there's like a critical point in the task where they were exposed essentially to your manipulation. If you reload at that point and re-expose them to a different condition, you've violated the, the, the um, assignment essentially of the, the, the task. Or even worse, if it's like a learning experiment, they get like 10 trials in and they reload, then they can like do the 10 trials again and their performance will be higher than they would otherwise. So you want to block that at some level. But we don't find if they reload and then want to reread the instructions, basically, for that reason. So finishes instructions is like a state variable that like you call and say, I'm done with the instructions. And what it really means is also like I'm done, I've been exposed to the treatment manipulation at that point. And at that, once you say finish instructions, it actually makes a little warning window. It, it triggers a new JavaScript event on the, on the browser window that will warn them and say, if you reload now, you're going to be kicked out of the experiment. So please don't reload the browser. So by triggering that event, it basically puts in a, a lock that says that they can no longer reload the browser window. But before you call finish instructions, it's OK if they want to reload the browser window. So it's a useful feature. And again, this is the kind of stuff that like, you know, maybe if you've used Citric, uh, if you've used Mechanical Trick before, you might not, you might have like thought like, what happens if the person reloads? And then you're kind of like, ah, I won't worry about it, right? Because you don't like want to program all this JavaScript and stuff. But part of the community aspect of Citric is that Many people have got, you know, someone spent a day or two figuring out this little issue of a cool way of like making sure that you don't let people reload the browser once they get exposed to this treatment condition. And then you get all that stuff for free from using Citric and then you don't have to program that stuff your, yourself. So that's when I say like the distri distribution of best practices is sort of like one of these things where as the community discovers, this is a cool trick you can do to prevent this and this is a cool trick you can do to prevent this to improve the quality of data you get from an online experiment all that stuff gets kind of shared back out to the community through the Citric system and then you don't have to go and implement all that stuff yourself. Okay, so uh, in the library folder, you often put like different uh, JavaScript libraries that you depend on. Um, a lot of them are, are the current dependencies in, for us are um, jQuery, Backbone, and Underscore, but you can also include all kinds of the fancy uh, JavaScript libraries that exist out there for doing things like drawing the browser window. You know, some people use uh, d3.js and things like that for making like fancy graphics. And what uh, Alex will talk about now is one example of that called JS Psych, which is a really great tool that was developed by Josh uh, Delu at um, uh, formerly Indiana. Now he's at uh, Vassar College, and he's uh, he's developed this open source JavaScript library for uh, making uh, experiments. That's really helpful for people who don't have a lot of JavaScript experience, uh, and it makes it really easy to program experiments. And so uh, I think. Uh, Alex is going to show us a little bit about how to do that within the side trick. Um, are there any questions though with all that stuff? Okay.
All right, yeah, so, um, right, so the sort of the front end of, of uh, your side experiment, you have to actually write all the, uh, all the HTML, of course, and then all the um, uh, experiment JavaScript code to be able to actually run the experiment. And uh, in our lab, we've uh, usually taken sort of the approach of more or less writing that from scratch, uh, you know, really getting down into the weeds and writing, uh, writing everything out to, to make a full interactive experiment. Um, but uh, Josh has been uh, putting a lot of time into uh, making this library uh, uh, JS Psych, um, which really does a lot of that uh, front end. So Psychic, you know, does all the back end work. It handles the server. It handles the uh, assigning to conditions and saving data. Uh, but at the front end, uh, JS Psych does a lot to make uh, this process of making interactive experiments a lot easier. Um, and it's come a long way and become a really powerful tool uh, to the extent that I'm actually thinking, hey, like I should probably start using this myself to make my life a lot easier. Um, and so we thought, you know, this would be a good tool to try to expose you guys to a little bit because um, I, I really do think it's, it's quite useful. Um, so, yeah, so programming uh, for the web uh, it, it, in general, um, you know, it's great because, uh, right, we more and more just spend all of our time in the web. And so, uh, you know, web companies uh, spend a lot of resources making really great, really spiffy JavaScript libraries that then as an experimenter you can uh, grab and, and make use of. Um, and you know they allow, they allow a lot more interactivity and stuff than uh, being stuck with like um, math. Uh, what's that thing in, in MATLAB? There, every psych toolbox or something, right? Like give some functionality, but the stuff that you can do in, in JavaScript is a lot uh, spiffier and, and easier to use. Um, uh, but of course, the challenge is that uh, there's some strange things about pro programming in a, a, a browser and asynchronies and events that can be happening at different times that you don't have to deal with uh, on a local. A computer in, in Python or MATLAB or something. Uh, you have to do database saving, things like that. Um, so uh, JS Psych takes care of that front end of coding the web page, whereas SciTurk, as we've been discussing, uh, handles some of that, that back end of uh, database storage and, and hosting a web server. All right, so you need to have some HTML and some CSS, um, but then the, the main part of your program is going to be written in uh, JavaScript. Um, so yeah, sort of backing up uh, a couple of things that are useful to know uh, is that JavaScript is not related to Java, it's just a, a separate language. Um, but it's the only language that generally that uh, browsers understand natively. So if you want to make a web experiment, you need to be writing in JavaScript uh, for the most part. Um, even these slides were actually uh, put into JavaScript, um, uh, were made in JavaScript. All right, so uh, you know, JavaScript can do most of the things you'd expect a program programming languages to do. Um, it can you know, create any type of interactivity you want. It can record your response times. It can send things back to the server. Um, you can even do uh, group experiments, um, as Jordan's going to talk about. Um, there's a few things that it can't do. It can't stop you from uh, uh, focusing away from a window. Um, it can't stop you from reloading a window, though it can give you a warning first and, be, and say, if you reload this window, you're going to be kicked out of the experiment. Um, and it can't directly save to files on the person's computer, right? So you have to send uh, information back to the database. All right, so uh, luckily you guys all know um, R and Python, which is great, so you have programming experience. You might not know a lot of JavaScript. Um, there's a ton of great resources for learning JavaScript, um, sort of from the ground up. Uh, Codecademy is one example, there's a lot of other ones. Um, we won't really have time to get into uh, uh, really deep learning about JavaScript today. Um, Although luckily, uh, a lot of the uh, JSEG makes things so easy that you actually don't need to know that much of the uh, sort of comp complexities of JavaScript. Uh, just as a really, really quick uh, guide to make sure people sort of understand what's going on. Um, you know, just like in Python, you uh, create variables. Uh, in JavaScript, you actually don't necessarily need to, but it's good practice to uh, declare a variable the first time you use it by using the word var in front of the variable. Um, so we would say var x equals seven, and then if we later say x, it'll, you know, uh, have that value. Um, you can uh, assign functions to variables um, by using your function uh, keyword. So uh, rather than saying def and then the name of the function, you just sort of uh, create the function and assign it to a variable, a little bit like a lambda uh, function uh, in Python. Um, so if I say var my function equals uh, the word function, and then I say it takes two parameters, uh, and then in the, in, inside the function, surrounded by uh, curly brackets like an R, uh, and then I say return parameter one plus parameter two. So this is a function that just adds two parameters together. Um, and then you know, I could call it with two numbers and it'll give me an answer. Uh, JavaScript have, has objects that uh, are very similar to Python dictionaries. 
So if I create an object with uh, key one is hello and key two is the number seven, uh, now I can uh, do my object dot key one and it'll return the value that's been assigned to that key. Um, I can also assign values to keys uh, by using uh, putting an equal sign after the uh, object dot key and it'll assign um, a new value to a new key. Um, and there's also arrays that are basically like uh, like JavaScript or like Python lists. Uh, and one thing that we'll be doing a lot in our example is adding new things to the end of an array. And the way you do that is the array dot push and the thing that you want to stick on to the end of the array. Um, so we have some sort of interactive uh, stuff for this portion. Unfortunately, I think because of time, we're not going to be able to spend a ton of time going through the interactivity. Uh, but one thing I think is really kind of important is uh, to get a sense of how you can like debug JavaScript and, and uh, uh, evaluate JavaScript in a, a browser window. So um, I encourage everyone to take a minute and um, figure out how to open up the uh, console, uh, the JavaScript console in their browser. Um, so I'm going to do that right now. I'll open up a new tab. Uh, and in Firefox, at least, the way you do it is you go to Tools, um, Web Developer, and then uh, I think Developer Toolbar. Nope, that's actually the wrong thing. Uh, tools, Web Developer, Toggle Tools. Yes, OK. Um, and that opens up a JavaScript console. So I think in Chrome, uh, it might be within the, I think it's within the View uh, section, and it's far somewhere else. So take a minute, talk with your neighbor, maybe put up a blue sticky when you figure out how to open the console. Yeah. On Windows, I have no idea. Well, I guess I have the same browser, so. I can open up Chrome as well and see if I can find it in there. So in Chrome, you go to View, Developer, Developer Tools, and then you go to the Console tab. All right, looks like we have fairly good uh, uptake on opening the console. Um, so just uh, to, to show a couple examples, you can basically uh, evaluate whatever JavaScript you want in here. So you can just sort of play around, do uh, you know var x equals five, and now uh, if I type in x, if I type in x here, it'll give me the answer. I can define a function. Uh, And so I would say this function is function of x and it just returns x times x. And then if I type square 5, it gives me 25. So uh, you know, just typing in random functions in the console, not that useful. But uh, once you have your uh, JavaScript experiment running and you know, something's not working, you can open up the console and you should be able to access any of the variables that you've created uh, in your experiment and kind of play around with things in real time and sort of see where the error is happening. Uh, error messages will print to the console, um, all types of things like that. All right. Um, so there's some simple kind of challenges I, for practice I've written here. You can always you know, go back later and, and do some of these if uh, you want to learn a very, very small amount of JavaScript. All right. So uh, and that's all we we'll, we'll really need for JSSEC. So uh, JSSEC um, kind of separates out the uh, structure and the content of a web experiment. So uh, of course, you have to make the content because you're the only no one who knows what the actual content of your experiment is. Uh, but JSPsych -like, uh, handles almost all the structure for you. So it can show instructions. It can uh, arrange your trial sequentially so that the participant just automatically goes from one to the next. Uh, it can show sort of a basic structure of a trial, like showing a stimulus and collecting a keyboard response, um, or showing a visual search arrays, all types of different things. Um, and then all you have to do is say, OK, what do the instructions actually say? or how long is the stimulus displayed, or what buttons are acceptable as responses for this trial. Um, so we can uh, define trials in JSPsych um, by uh, using different JSPsych plugins. Um, and so a plugin is basically just uh, a really simple JavaScript um, uh, object where uh, you first have to give the type of the plugin, which tells JSPsych basically you know, what type of trial is, is this. Um, so here it's like a, we're using a single stin uh, plugin type, which is a very common one, of course. Um, and we say that, you know, the stimulus, we say, okay, use this JPEG file as the stimulus. Uh, let the person use either A or B as their choices. 
uh, and give them a prompt, is this person in group A or group B? And so you know, once we have JSA set up on our uh, experiment, basically all we have to do is define this object and kind of add it into the right place. Uh, and just like that, you get this thing on the screen that the participant will see where that has the face and has uh, the question and will record their response and record reaction time and all that. Um, which obviously if you're trying to do this completely from scratch, it would be quite a lot of coding to get all this to, to work right. Um, and then if you wanted to do another trial with a different face, all you have to do is create this, exactly the same plugin but with uh, a different file for the different uh, stimulus. Um, we could have uh, another plugin that just shows a, uh, a fixation point um, that, that stays on for 500 milliseconds, uh, et cetera. So there's a lot of different options uh, available. And then we take all these individual plugins and they're then going to be sequenced into a, a timeline. So every experiment, you know, if you kind of think to the experiments you've done, it kind of has a timeline. It starts in the beginning and goes sequentially uh, through a set of, of trials or instructions. Um, right? We have an order list of trials. Uh, and JSEC gives you a lot of uh, flexibility here. So it could just be uh, completely static and sequential, um, but we could also uh, nest a timeline. So there might be a certain uh, block structure where there's a, a kind of structure that uh, is repeated multiple times. You can do that in JSEC. Um, you could have uh, changes to the timeline uh, based on conditionals. So maybe you say, okay, if somebody's in condition one, send them to this part and then this part, or if they're in condition two, do it in the reverse order, uh, and so forth. All right, so of course, uh, hopefully that shows that JSEC can be kind of you know, helpful because it uh, takes advantage of the fact that experiments tend to have similar structures. They all have these kind of, uh, they have similar timelines, they have similar trial structures, um, unless you really rapidly put everything together uh, to create a new experiment that's, you know, in some way similar to the ones that have come before, but has your customizations for what you need. Um, there are a few settings in which JSEG might not be really uh, helpful. Um, if your experiment is extremely uh, complex and novel and really not similar in structure to other experiments, then JSEG might not have the uh, types of freedom that you need. Um, or if you have an extremely simple experiment, like just a survey, uh, you might not need uh, JSEG. In fact, in that case, you might not really need Sidetrack. You might just want to, um, you know, just do a static survey on Qualtrics or something like that. So to add JSEG into a, a Sidetrack project, um, here again is kind of the layout of the project, uh, like Todd was showing before. And basically, we just um, this is uh, already included in the uh, Sidetrack experiment that we're going to be pulling in. But if you didn't have it already included, you would go um, onto the JSEG website, basically just download it and stick the files into your JS folder. Um, so you'd have a little JS psych folder and then you'd put in JS psych.js and then the, the code for the plugins that you're going to use. Um, so this is obviously an extremely whirlwind tour. We're gonna go a little bit in a hands-on way. Um, but if you wanna learn more about JS psych, uh, there's a, a, a very good set of documentations that we're gonna look at a tiny bit um, that has you know, how to do a basic experiment, um, its features, uh, and a list of all the different plugins you can do. So you could do you know, uh, a categorization trial or instructions trial, um, similarity rating, Likert. Uh, so they really put together a lot of different resources for you. Um, you can get the code on their uh, GitHub site. And uh, there's a Google group for JS Psych as well where you can uh, ask questions. All right. so. Uh, Let's move on into the real hands-on part of this tutorial. Um, so hopefully everybody has uh, logged on to your, um, uh, to your servers. Uh, so Todd has set up uh, the Scytric example experiment. Um, but we've actually set up another, uh, um, uh, we set up an experiment on the experiment exchange that uses uh, JS Psych uh, with Scytric to set up a simple Stroop experiment. We're gonna uh, kind of walk through that together. So, if we, so if you open up your uh, terminal, and I'm just going to go back to the, uh, the root directory here. So or maybe I'll just open up a new terminal so we're all on the same page. So if you open up your terminal, uh, new terminal, and uh, let's just type, um, well, let's go to the experiment exchange and get the special code that we need. So I'm going to go to scituric.org slash ee, experiment exchange. 
And if you scroll down to the bottom, uh, the very last one here is Stroop example with JS Psych. So you're going to click on that and copy over this line of code, Psytrick dash install. Uh, don't include the dollar sign, that's just supposed to sort of simulate the command prompt. Let's just paste that in. Uh, and if anything's breaking for people, just you know, put up a red sticky and hopefully someone can give you a hand uh, getting this to work. Uh, so again, like before, it says you know, download into stroop.js psych, so that's great. I'm going to cd into the stroop.js psych folder. And I'm going to type ls to list what we have in here. Um, so what we actually did here is we, we made two complete sort of separate experiment folders. Um, one is underscore uh, complete, which is just like the full experiment with everything kind of working. Uh, and we also have an underscore skeleton one so that we can kind of start from the real basics and then kind of build the experiment up piece by piece. Um, so for, uh, just to show you guys what it's going to look like, I'll, I'll first quickly go into the complete folder. And uh, I'm going to edit the uh, config file in there. Um, you guys can do this as well, or you can just wait until we do it for the uh, skeletal version. Um, but I'm just going to change it from localhost again to 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0.0. And for these servers, we need to be using the port 1723. Um, so I'm just going to save those two things. And now I should be able to test it out. It's telling me that we don't have any Scyther credentials or AMT credentials, and so we wouldn't be able to, to go really put things on the web here, but for our purposes of just testing, that should be okay. I'm going to uh, type Scyther, I'm going to turn on the server. I'm going to do uh, debug-p again to get a link. And this will just let me show you guys what this is going to look like. All right, so I'm consenting. Okay, so this, uh, as a finished project, this is going to uh, be a really, really quick Stroop experiment. Um, and so uh, it says, okay, welcome to the experiment. We can press space to begin. Uh, when a word appears, uh, uh, respond with the color of the word as quickly as you can using red for R, uh, R for red, G for green, and B for blue. Um, so there's going to be a little fixation, and then, okay, this is a green word, I'm going to press G. This is a red word, I'm going to press R, uh, et cetera. And there's three, uh, this is only a nine trial experiment, but there's going to be, there's three different types of trials. Um, so there's uh, unrelated words like this, where uh, it's just like a word that's not a color word, right? So that's pretty easy mentally to um, say, okay, that's blue. Uh, and there's uh, incongruent trials where the word itself is different from the color. So here's an incongruent trial. It's a little harder to say, ah, do I type G for green or R for red? Um, so that should slow people down. Here's another incongruent trial. It's a blue word red. And there's the third type is congruent trials, right? So uh, here the word is blue and it's the color blue. Um, so those should be quite easy. So I'm going to go through, uh, you'll go through these nine trials. And then at the end, it's going to tell you uh, your response times for the three types. Of course, I was kind of pausing to talk, so this isn't very useful. But in theory, if you do enough people, you should see that right. the congruent trials uh, are quite fast. And probably the uh, unrelated trials will be fast as well. And the incongruent trials should be a bit slower. And it'll give us a uh, 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 percent correct for each type as well. Um, and then when you're done, you can press Q. OK. So that's kind of what we're working towards. So let's exit out of um, the complete experiment now. And go into the skeletal experiment. Uh, all right, so uh, I want everybody, to, uh, this is where we kind of want to start being uh, definitely sort of doing this as a group. So uh, if everybody can. Um, Go into the uh, experiment underscore skeleton and go into the config.txt and make these two changes to the uh, server parameter. So you want to go to 0.0.0.0 .0 .0 .0 .0 for the host and 
one seven two three for the port. And make sure to save that file. And then uh, in your terminal, you want to navigate into the uh, experiment underscore skeleton directory. Um, so if you're if you're in the root directory, you're going to use the cd command for that. So you do cd stroop.jspsych, and then you can do cd experiment skeleton, uh, and then run scikit. And then uh, to make sure that this all is working. Uh, Turn on the server and do a debug p uh, to print the link and then copy this link and open it in a tab and see if you can get to uh, this screen. Um, can you open yeah. To your terminals? yeah. So you're gonna once you're in the folder, you're gonna type scyturk uh, server on debug-p. Um, and people, feel free to like, raise a question if you think you have uh, questions for the group. And in config.txt, uh, you're going to change uh, the host to 0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.0 and the port to 1723. So maybe I can get these in two and see them at the same time, perhaps. We should, so you want to go into the experiment underscore skeleton um, directory. And uh, yeah, put up a blue sticky if you have uh, got that set up. Is there a question? Some people aren't. Uh, And you have the dot one seven two three uh, as the port number. Okay, yeah. I mean, there there could be some. Uh, we were trying to get the IT stuff all set up, but there it's possible that there might be some some issues. Um, raise your hand if you can get it working. Okay, it's non-zero. That's great. So it's possible. It's possible for some people. At least. There might, there might be issues with some of the servers that are, that are messing up. So once you open SciTurk, you're going to type server space on, and then debug dash p. So I can do it again here. So I'm in uh, the experiment underscore skeleton folder, and I'm typing SciTurk. And I'm typing server on, and I'm typing debug dash p. And you notice here that it says uh, we have the, the host name here, and then it says uh, colon 1723, and that's how you know that the, uh, that the port has been set appropriately. I think since we're a little bit short on time anyway, I think I'll, I'll mostly kind of uh, go through this up here as kind of a demonstration. Um, and anybody who things are working and you're kind of quick at following along, you can follow along and that's awesome. Uh, but if not, you can just kind of watch what's going on up here and it'll give you a flavor for kind of how uh, putting this together uh, works. Because um, yeah, there's a lot of material that's sort of going over uh, in a short time. So at least for me, um, uh, I've, uh, you know, since I was able to go over with the tech people before, make sure that it at least worked uh, for myself. Um, I, I've got this, uh, I've got Scytric uh, running. And um, so somewhere here we had, I guess I'll just use this link again so I don't know where that window went. Um, and I will start the experiment. So uh, right now it's just, uh, it says, welcome to the experiment, press space to begin. 
and you press space and uh, nothing happens because it's just a really sort of minimal version. So let's look at what the actual code uh, for this looks like. Okay. So let me get rid of some of these. So since we're sort of working in this uh, environment, we end up with a lot of different uh, browser tabs. Um, all right, so in the experiment, um, we have, uh, as Todd kind of demonstrated before, there's static templates, the config, uh, and some other things that we'll get to talk about a little bit. Um, so if I go into uh, the templates here, I see this experiment.html, uh, really important uh, main template. And OK, it says, all right, this is a JS psych plus psych check example. Um, and as Todd showed, it has uh, the, the, the library for loading. Um, and it, significantly, it shows that we're loading JS psych, uh, the JS psych library, and some JS psych plugins, and psych check itself. Um, and then there's loading in the condition and things like that, as we showed. Um, and then uh, a kind of important thing here is that we just have this uh, one div tag in uh, the body. Um, the body of our HTML page that says it's going to be the JS psych target. So JS psych will kind of be putting all its content into there. Uh, and then after that, we have this one last script for uh, the actual experiment logic. Uh, and the nice thing is that none of the actual, um, uh, basically all the content of the experiment is happening in our task.js thing. So you don't really have to be going back between HTML and your JavaScript code. You're basically just writing all the stuff in JavaScript and having JavaScript generate what you actually see on the screen. Um, so now that we've sort of looked at the uh, experiment.html page, we don't really have to go back to it. We can just look at uh, the task.js uh, uh, file um, and, just, and then just know that everything it does is going to be stuck into this uh, div tag in the middle of our experiment. All right, so let's go out of templates then and into our static.js and uh, I've, I've put up uh, in here a set of uh, files kind of building the experiment up piece by piece. As I said, we're going to have to go through a little quickly, but um, you can kind of look at this afterwards and sort of see how it goes through. Um, so at the beginning, uh, we start with a really, really, uh, this should be open as a, uh, should be able to open this as a editable file. All right, so at the beginning, uh, this is our entire experiment code. So. Are people still able to read it like this, or do you want it a little bit bigger? Is it bigger, please? That good? Yeah. OK. Um, so right now, there's hardly anything happening, right? So the, the first really important thing that we do is we uh, load SciTurk into uh, the code. Um, and it gets these unique IDs, and server information uh, are sort of propagated in by the server automatically. Uh, and we're saving our SciTurk object as a variable called SciTurk. Then we're creating a timeline which uh, JSSEC is going to use to sequence the entire experiment. And we're just starting that as an empty array, or like an empty list in Python. We're going to add stuff to that as we create trials. Uh, and right now, we've just created one trial using a really simple plugin, uh, just a text plugin. Uh, so we create a welcome block, um, which is a JavaScript option uh, object. Uh, it has a type property, which has its text. This is a text trial. And it has the actual content of the text. Um, which is, you know, welcome to the experiment, press space key to begin. Uh, and then we uh, push that onto the timeline. So now our timeline has one trial in it, which is the welcome block. And then here's where JS psych comes in. So we say JS psych dot init. So start the experiment. And we tell it that uh, the display element it's going to use is that JS psych target element. Um, and the timeline is this timeline list. We just give it that list. Um, and so right now it's saying, you know, create an experiment and go through the timeline. The timeline is just a welcome screen. Um, so what we wrote here as the challenge was, you know, set the welcome block to only end when the user presses space. So uh, the automatic behavior is that uh, for a text block, any button will make it continue. Um, but this is a chance that we can kind of, okay, say, so how would we make it so that it only continues at space? Uh, we can find that out by going to the uh, JS site docs. Uh, so I'm going to go uh, docs. .jsec.org. And I can sort of scroll down to say, OK, plugins, plugins, jsec dash text. And OK, here's the parameters. So we have to give it the text. Oh, and we have to give it a continue key. 
So an array or the word mouse. And in the array, you want to put down the different keys that you can use to continue. Um, so I can uh, take this and sort of edit here and say, OK, uh, I want the continue key to be uh, just space. So I'm going to make a little uh, array here. I'm just going to put a space character in it. I'm going to save this file. And now if I go back, if I can find the experiment screen. Oops. All right, I just refreshed the experiment screen. Um, we're in sort of debug mode, so it'll let you refresh during the experiment, which is really great for debugging. Uh, so now that I saved my JavaScript difference, um, if I try to load, so it's still uh, continuing after I press any key. So let's see why that's happening. Um, but we should get it so that it only lets you continue if you press the space key. Uh, let me just make sure everything's pointed to the right thing. All right, just using task.js, that's good. Um, let's get another link. Technical difficulties, maybe I put something incorrectly. Just to see if uh, let's see if these changes propagate. Okay, so it, we are getting the we are getting uh, uh, the experiment from that task.js file because I just changed the words here and that uh, Propagated. Okay, for some reason it's not following the continue key rules. Um, I can try to blame that on JS psych instead of psych trick, but that's probably something that I did wrong. Um, but we'll move on and see if it catches up later. All right. So in theory, that should make it so that you only continue when you uh, press the uh, the continue key. Um, all right. So moving on to the next uh, the next kind of step here. Uh, so. We go back into the JS files. Um, the next step would be adding the instructions. Let me make that look nicer. So we could just add another uh, block after the welcome block that's an instructions block. And this is going to be another text block. So the type is text again. Here we have a little bit more uh, text, and I've added some HTML markup in here. So you know the text is going to show up as a couple of paragraphs. We saw this before, uh, telling you uh, what to do. Um, and again, uh, we added a continue key, uh, and we added another uh, option that you have here, which is uh, adding a little time after the trial. So after the experiment is complete, it's going to just sort of pause it with a blank screen for a second before going on to the trial. Um, and JSEC also lets you. Uh, Set uh, other functions to be triggered after a uh, after a plugin is done, which is what makes it really uh, useful to interface it with Scikit. So uh, basically, here we say that on the finish, uh, when the instruction is finished, we're going to call this function that calls Scikit.finish instruction. Um, so just like that, we can kind of integrate Scikit into the JS Psych plugin, um, and it will automatically tell Scikit that the instructions are finished once we finish this instructions block. Um, so I'm going to copy. Uh, so maybe the easy way to do this, I'm just going to uh, start changing as we go through these different versions. I'll just change uh, which task file uh, the experiment is pointing to. Um, so if we do. Uh, Add instructions. 
then it's going to uh, include the instructions now. And it's not doing that. Uh, okay, so maybe in the interest of, uh, since these things aren't seeming to work that well and we have a fairly limited time, uh, uh, time up, uh, allotted, I'm going to try to just sort of walk quickly through the uh, complete experiment. Um, and I think there's maybe, I don't know, something weird going on with the Jupyter notebook or I'm just <coughs> trying to do something. Um, but later if you have time, you can go through those skeleton pieces and you should be able to build up the experiment um, and have it kind of update as you, um, as you update it piece by piece. So I'm gonna go back into the, uh, I'm gonna split it up using the, uh, the, the complete experiment and then just kind of briefly walk through what the different parts of JSEC are doing. Again, the full experiment. Great. And let's go over to the task file. Now we have the full entire task. Quickly show you what's going on. Uh, you've seen this part before. We've got the side trigger, we've got the timeline, we have the welcome block that we're pushing on, we have the instructions block that we're pushing on to uh, our timeline as well. Um, uh, now we have this set of, um, well, let me get back to this in a minute. This is, uh, this is kind of a, a, a list of all the trial information for all the different Stroop trials. Um, but before showing you that kind of data of what the trials look like, let me show you the two plugins that actually are running these trials. So we have two more plugins here. We have a fixation plugin, which is those fixation things that you're seeing uh, briefly before each trial. So that, uh, running that fixation. So that's just a single stimulus that has a little fixation point. Um, we're telling you that there's no keys for this that you just you know, go on, uh, and it just shows up for 500 milliseconds. And we're telling you that it's a uh, fixation type uh, piece of data. Uh, and then the most important trial type we have, the most important plugin is uh, the word plugin. So uh, again, a single stimulus. Um, it's going to have uh, some piece of text as the stimulus, um, and it's going to be uh, different for each trial, right? So the word is you know, red for one trial, and then it's blue for the next, and then it's like Zamboni or whatever the unrelated word was for the third. Um, and so we're adding this thing in here that's telling it that, okay, this part is gonna be, we're gonna have a bunch of these words and, and the actual stimulus part's gonna be different each time. And so JSEC is kind of handling that difference by saying the stimulus is gonna be um, this timeline variable stimulus that we're gonna sort of pass in uh, separately for each trial. Um, and there's gonna be these choices, R, G, or V, uh, and uh, the data uh, is also gonna be a little different, right? Because uh, the correct answer and things like that are different for each trial. Um, and then uh, after the trial, we're going to sort of calculate which was the correct answer, um, and kind of that's how that will work. Uh, and then unfortunately, I don't have time to kind of really make this make sense uh, for everybody, but uh, JSEC is this really cool thing where um, we can say that, okay, the test procedure is, 
made up of a, a series of little timelines that are fixation and then a word, right? So this is a nested timeline here. It's fixation word, fixation word, fixation word. Um, and the data that goes into each fixation word pair uh, is going to be uh, coming, so the data that goes into each fixation pair is this variable trials, which goes back up here. We have our list of all our trials. So basically, we just define uh, all, this, all, the all the stimulus data um, of like what each trial looks like. So you know, the first uh, one trial of the stimulus is uh, the word ship, colored red. And it's, you know, the word is ship, the color is red, the stimulus type is unrelated. Another trial, uh, the word is monkey, the, uh, the word is monkey, the color is green. Um, again, unrelated, color green, et cetera. Um, so we just have the uh, uh, stimulus information uh, that we kind of just pass in as uh, a list here to, uh, to our test procedure. Um, so the, the, the code for like making the fixation, making the word, you just have to write once and then you just send in all the information that sequences all the trials uh, and randomizes them for you as well. And we just push that whole thing onto the procedure. Um, then at the very end, um, we uh, do a, a summary um, where uh, JSEG has these really cool tools that you can um, grab. Sorry, making this a little small so that we can fit the whole line in here. But basically, you can just uh, grab pieces of data out of uh, the data after it's saved uh, and get the, the mean uh, response time for different parts of, parts of data and things like that and just stick them into the text, which is a very uh, nice tool to have. Uh, and then going back to uh, some of the cyclic uh, interaction, you can tell JS like that for each of the trials, you want to save in like the condition and everything like that that's coming from cyclic. That will then automatically be saved for each trial. Um, and then at the end of the task, um, we have JSCyc uh, tell SciTurk uh, to um, record as unstructured data, uh, basically the grand total percent correct as a bonus field. Um, and then we JSCyc tells SciTurk to save data back to the server, and it tells it to uh, compute the bonus, um, which is going to go back to a uh, uh, a route back on the server that's written in Python. It's, it's uh, a very simple little route um, that will add the bonus as a little field uh, into uh, the database, which then lets you use a Scikit command that will automatically uh, give a bonus to each person on Mechanical Turk uh, using that field. And so you can have each, you know, you run 100 people in the experiment. Um, they all have different performances. And then with one line on Scikit, it'll send each of those people the correct amount of money uh, for the bonus. Uh, based on that little uh, script. So uh, that's a pretty cool ability to have because otherwise, if you want to do this on the Amazon website, you have to click on each person individually and type in the amount of bonus you want to give them. So that can save a lot of work. Um, so unfortunately, we didn't get to go through this in as much detail as we hoped, but um, hopefully you can see that this entire Stroop experiment is 154 lines of code, uh, a lot of which are just the specifications for the stimuli. Um, so it's like a, a very, very simple and compact way of making an experiment without knowing a lot of JavaScript. Um, so if you want to uh, finish up by showing what you can do with the data. Okay, so um, the last thing that we're going to do really quickly is just to complete back up to the uh, day one session where we're talking about uh, the uh, Jupyter Notebook. Um, in the Stroop experiment, uh, JS, in the experiment complete, there's an analysis uh, IPython notebook that was included. And I included that as a demonstration of how you can use the Jupyter notebook to like immediately grab the data out of your, the data that you would have collected from an experiment so, uh, and analyze it right away. So the, um, in this folder, there's a participants demo.db, which is uh, like the, where the data was saved, but it's a demo because I pre-populated it. Like I just did the experiment myself a little bit and collected some data uh, in that experiment. And so then if you open up the analysis, the IPython um, notebook, there's like this little notebook that gives uh, example commands that you would use in, uh, in Jupyter to like uh, do an analysis of that uh, Stroop experiment. Um, and so, 
Uh, basically, uh, as it turns out, like that data is stored, like I said before, in a SQLite uh, database. Um, and it turns out that like Pandas uh, can read directly from SQLite, like the data frame for that. And so um, in this first cell, there's basically like imports Pandas, imports SQLite 3, which is the SQLite Python library. And then in these like three lines here, it, it <coughs> connects to the database that has the data from the Cytric experiment and reads it all into a data frame called DF. And we can verify that it works by uh, uh, running it here, hopefully. Hopefully this Jupyter notebook will actually run, yeah. And it set, starts up here, and it basically pulls in the data frame uh, from this hypothetical experiment that we just that, that we just conducted that Alex showed how you would program. Um, I mean, the default Citric database uh, has the format of, it includes some, just each line of the database is like sort of a descriptor of, uh, of a particular worker who completed the task or may have completed the task. It includes like things like the assignment worker ID and hit ID, which are all Mechanical Turk strings that are created uh, whenever someone uses the Mechanical Turk. The IP address, what browser they used, uh, it tries to infer what operating system they're using, whether it's Mac or, or um, Windows and so forth. Uh, they can even infer the language settings in the browser, what condition they were in, what time they began the hit, what time they ended the hit, and so forth. And then there's a column for the bonus, which is like Alex just showed how you can automatically compute the bonus, or you can edit that yourself in this in this database. And then the last thing is a data string, and it contains the, all the data that you had saved incrementally using Citric. So it's going to include like it's just a string that represents in JSON like the structure of the entire uh, uh, experiment. Um, yeah, and so um, it's probably, uh, given the amount of time we have left, it's probably not worth going into it's like super, super detailed steps involved here, but basically you have to parse that JSON script in order, or that JSON uh, string in order to get access to the data that was stored in that, um, that thing. So uh, here's an example command of, of doing that where basically um, I'm using that query uh, uh, operator that on the data frame that uh, uh, Jess talked about where I'm going to ask for, um, this is a query that will ask from the data frame that we just read in from the SQLite, um, any place where the data string is equal to data string. So that uh, catches any place where someone didn't have a data string at all. Like, uh, so like if the data string was empty, it turns out that null, null will be false and so like uh, it will get rid of those people. And it, and it sets anyone whose status is three. So as people go through a Citric experiment, they have a status number assigned to them that's sort of like how far they got in, like the first, the status one would mean like I just saw the experiment but I didn't accept it or something like that and status two would be like I entered into the experiment, status three was like I completed the experiment, status four might be like uh, the person was accredited and then status five was like they were paid their bonus and so forth and so the subject rises up in their status uh, as they go through and so we want to collect people that are status three there's a link here for like what the full list of status codes are currently in SciTurk. And so status above three means that the person completed the entire experiment. And so that's the people who we want to get. So if we get a clean, um, it doesn't, doesn't drop anyone because all the data was accurate here, but this gets everyone that was status three, um, all, the, all the subjects that were status three. And then uh, it turns out here that then what we want to do is get the, like a tidy representation of the uh, actual trial data stuff, um, or, or the, the data that was recorded. And so I wrote this little function here that uses the data, uh, it creates a, a, a function that can be applied to the data frame that ex essentially extracts out from the JSON the, um, the, a tidy representation of the uh, uh, SciTurk data that was collected in this experiment. So when I run that, you can see it looks like it, um, or actually it's not, it's not quite to that level yet, let's see. Oh no, it is. This is just the head of it, the file. Yeah. So like it, it's a, it's a. This looks like the tidy format in the sense that uh, there's a bunch of descriptors of the individual trial. There's like trial number zero through whatever. There's like nine trials or something like that in this like little demo experiment. There is the um, unique ID, which is like a unique identifier for that subject, and it's repeated multiple times here because there's like a different line for every uh, for every trial of the experiment. So we have that descriptor. So this is that tidy representation. And then it has things like um, the key press, what key they present, present press, the reaction time in milliseconds, what stimulus was presented. So you can see that some, the word was the, the JavaScript, or the 
style sheet that describes what, what word was presented, uh, what trial type it was, fixation or congruent or, or uh, a neutral word, and so forth are all presented in this data frame. Uh, and then as a final step, we can just uh, use those map plot uh, uh, and seaborne type things to like uh, find out. So what we're going to compute is the mean uh, reaction time as a function of condition. Uh, and so I think if I run this here, uh, huh? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so right. So you can see as a function of stimulus type, uh, it, it took people in this. Uh, it took me when I ran it five times really quickly on myself. Uh, about 1650 milliseconds to respond to the congruent ones and 1741 for the incongruent ones, which is sort of the standard Stroop effect. So even in a quick run, I was you could detect that Stroop pattern. And it turns out I was really fast for the unrelated ones. Um, and then you can go through the whole like Seaborn plotting to plot the means from that experiment. And it should load in just a second here. Yeah, and so you get like mean, mean reaction time was a little faster for, for congruent versus incongruent or something like that. But so I guess like that's, the, the point of this is basically one, to give you this code. Now you're a little bit familiar with the Jupyter notebook. You have this code and the code kind of shows you how to actually reach into the database that Scytrix saves and to extract the data in the format that would be then useful to turn it into that tidy representation. And then you can link it up with all the things that Jess talked about. You could do R analysis, you could pass this through to R really quickly. You could do, you know, whatever you want. I just wanted to give you the scripts necessary to, in this, uh, this kind of ecosystem, how you would uh, take data that was collected with Scituric and then quickly enable it into this ecosystem of, of um, tidy rich data representations and like pandas uh, functions and so forth. Um, yeah, so that's, so that's the basic workflow. So we kind of tried to show, I guess maybe to summarize, we tried to show you, just give you a, a rough introduction to like maybe the advantages for using Scituric for running experiments, some of the benefits that come from adopting a kind of common workflow for doing s simple behavioral experiments online and the advantages that come for so much of these tools have already been built out so you don't have to implement all this stuff from scratch yourself. Um, and, the, and then we showed how you could uh, check experiments out and really quickly replicate them, which is really easy. You could then modify the JavaScript. Uh, Alex showed you some tools like JS Psych that like kind of give you uh, an easy to use entry point for designing JavaScript experiments. Um, and the example code, at least, if you have a chance to go back and look at it yourself, uh, you can see how to build up the logic of an experiment like that. And then the data, get, in this case, gets saved in the SQLite database, but it, it could also come from a C, MySQL database or whatever. And I just showed you how to convert that into a tidy data format and begin doing data analysis on your experiment. So um, that's all that we wanted to show you today about SciTurk, it's just kind of a rough introduction. And I guess we're gonna try to go back now and see if we got any aliens. Uh, while we were here, it's kind of like our closing uh, closing thing. So do you want to uh, try, try that? If you want to uh, do that, see, I can try to okay. Like, uh, okay. So let's see. So um, we're, gonna, we're gonna connect back to our lab server and see if we if we got any workers who were willing to help us out by drawing aliens. So he's typing hit status active. Oops. Uh, oh, hit list. All right, so the fact that there's no pending and no complete means that uh, they're not complete until you pay them, so that means that they've all finished that. Yeah, so review. it says reviewable now. So that hit was, we made five slots for five people to do it. Originally they said five were pending because five people were sitting on the hit waiting to have, have to get it done. And now it says reviewable, meaning like we could go and check to make sure the work was up to our quality. Is it the normal step that you would do? Most experimenters, I guess, uh, actually just um, uh, give credit to anyone who completes the experiment. So you have that special graph there. Yeah, uh, I think it's called, uh, I actually don't remember. Q. Yeah. I don't remember the URL, but once you see it. That cat custom gallery. Oh, there it is. 
Sorry, John. Sorry, John. John. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah, that's right. Go back to the script. Go back to the real time. Um, it's got, it is gallery. Just go on and do the raw thing. Okay, cool. <coughs> and then, oh, actually, I think you have to go back to your config that text real quick. Uh, to see cat config that text. I think it might be. Okay. Example name, example password. Right, so there are, f are uh, well, so we have so we have six here, right? So there's Alex's demo that he did of his cow uh, alien, and then here are five mechanical Turk workers who came up with creative aliens, like while we were doing that. So now, them too now. Yeah, so you now, so now we'll show like so that was so that was a thing where you know we we were able to replicate that within just a couple uh, seconds. So now we're going to show you really quickly how you then pay people with with. So, so I'm going to turn off the server because we don't need it. So we're done. Anymore. We're like shut down the server. And then uh, just do uh, Okay, so uh, there's a bunch of worker, uh, or maybe you should talk about it. Okay, yeah, so there's a worker command that lets you do different things to individual workers. So you can like approve workers, you can reject them, you can unreject them if you have previously rejected them, you can assign them a bonus, and you can list all the workers. Uh, and so in this case, he's going to type, um, uh, Hit list uh, active to find the, the actual uh, the hit, and it has a hit ID, a special code that Amazon has, and so we have to look that up so that we know uh, which hit we want to approve the workers for. And then he just types worker approve dash dash hit, and then that hit ID. And then as he goes through, it just went through and approved those five workers, and that meant that money was transferred from our account to the account of those workers, and um, and they've been paid now. Um, and they won't get a bonus, I don't think. So, they, but if you wanted to do bonus, you do uh, the same thing, like worker bonus, and it would like look in that little database field that where the bonus was calculated, and it would like give those people the, the, the credit for their bonus. So, I guess the idea there is just that that stuff, like it's a lot easier just to type those commands than it is to go to the Amazon website and have to do all the clicking that you normally have to do to kind of approve everybody. And this app sort of prevents errors because you like it does it kind of programmatically against the list of workers that are available, so you might like accidentally fail to click something. That won't happen in this case. And at the end, end result, now that that hit's done, it says complete all five, is because all five of the people that we asked to draw the aliens have been successfully paid. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay, so I think that's all the that's all we have for today. I guess it's kind of time to break for lunch. Uh, got started a little 10, 10 minutes early, but are there any final questions that anyone has, or? Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. So the question was, can JS Psych be used with things other than Mechanical Turk? And JS Psych is just a general library that's sort of very helpful for doing types of things in JavaScript that you might want to do for experiments, and so it can be used for anything. Yeah. And you can use Psytrick in the lab as well. And you can use Psytrick in the lab. So I was just like, Psytrick also doesn't. I mean, it's it's Psytrick, so it has Turk in it. It's sort of very much built around the Turk ecosystem, but. We use it, um, you can use it for lab experiments. So, so we use the same code base for doing laboratory experiments as, as Mechanical Turk ones. There's a, um, a way that basically you just, kind of like how you were debugging it, you can just point a browser window at your Psytrick process once you have it running in the lab, and then the people can take part in it just in that, that way. So there's sort of a lab mode, like where you could let the person do the Psytrick experiment in a lab without having to go on Mechanical Turk. You just don't need to do all the work or bonusing and approving and stuff like that. So you can still use it to get the same data in the same format. You can then arbitrarily mix um, online subjects with laboratory subjects and so forth if you wanted to. And in the really extreme examples of that, we've had, uh, we've done, we've used Citric as a backend for like iPad experiments. So we do some developmental work where the JavaScript 
uh, has really been suited for touch interfaces with, and so we and like let little kids get an iPad, and they are basically loading uh, a Scituric experiment and then running an iPad experiment. Um, and so there's, there's examples of people doing uh, that kind of thing as well. So it ends up being like once you implement this web type framework, it ends up being quite useful in many other circumstances other than other than online experiments to kind of have a web based. You know, once you once you switch over to designing your experiment in web instead of using MATLAB, for instance it sort of makes sense to just do it for everything that you do, because it's more, it's more flexible in how you can use it. Yeah, that, yeah, that hey, yeah, also very general question. What is the uh, roadmap like for the future of SciTurk? Uh, I don't know, so, uh, I don't know, we've been talking about it. Some, some of it is, is interesting to hear what Ballinger is doing, because I think like some of the things that they're doing are sort of uh, partly things that we thought about doing uh, and they may be already kind of moving for, further along on it. Like I think one thing that we would uh, like to do is to make um, it uh, completely scriptable. So right now you have to, you kind of have to interactively type your things uh, at the command line. Yeah. And it would be nice if like it was all encapsulated in a, in a standard Python binding. So that way you could actually uh, share a script with people yeah. and the script would be the protocol that you used for recruitment even. So like you could, you could, you know, because right now you would like uh, type like create hit five people and get five people and then create hit 10 and get 10 more. And you kind of do that incrementally until you ret met, met your threshold of how many subjects you wanted to do. But it'd be nice if you could just write a script that um, could uh, automate some of that stuff. And some people have, have kind of hacked together solutions like that within SciTurk, but it'd be nice if it was a core uh, Python library. And so that's one thing that we're kind of interested in, in doing. And I don't know, what are the other, what are the other things that people yeah. That's pretty one of the big uh, ones. Maybe, maybe like uh, there's some other services other than Mechanical Turk that interface with some of those as well. Yeah, exactly. So there's other there's other services besides Mechanical Turk that that recruit crowd workers, and so it'd be interesting to like make bi general bindings that operate behind the scenes that let you use arbitrary services and so forth. And so that would be that would be some other future uh, future directions. Um, uh, yeah, and then there's been some discussion about possibly, so one thing that, that people find frustrating a little bit is it's nice if you can sometimes share a copy of your experiment um, in a, uh, where it, you, you could actually send someone a link kind of post-publication, like or as part of the publication of your paper, you could include a link to your experiment and like let a reviewer or something like that kind of play the experiment. And since scitrix has got this thing where you could, you can do that with the experiment exchange, you could sh tell them, hey, go to the experiment exchange and you can download the code for the experiment and you can see it yourself. But that might mean a little bit more work for them because they'd have to like install the Scitrix tool and, and type some commands to get it going. That's, it's still, we you said, it's like, it doesn't take that long, but it's probably too much for a reviewer to do if they just wanted to get a quick sense of what your experiment was like. So some people like the fact that they can kind of just host their little simple experiment on a web server that's constantly available and then you can just point reviewers and say, if you want to know what the experiment looked like, just click here and then you can click around in it. Um, it would be nice if we could make persistently running uh, Scituric processes that could provide kind of a static URL that someone could always go to to check that, check it out. You know? um, so that's another thing that we've talked about. Yeah, in the back there. Um, I think it's, uh, there's like something like 800 worker, or people that have signed up as like, uh, as users of the system um, on the, st the stats. So I can show you like, we have a stats page. It doesn't load all the time, but. Let's see, there's some statistics on it. Probably one of those. Can we open it again or will it like? It'll probably not work that well. Okay, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think we've, uh, I think that I looked at it last and there's been, um, we've, like, one way to count the users is not, the users, the number of people signed up is not that good of a account. So there's been 15 experiments shared. There's probably like 20 or something GitHub contributors. Um, there's 800 people who have signed up on the scitrick.org website to have an account with scitrick, but not all of those actually converted to using it. Um, and then I think we've encountered, so by the tracking thing, we can count how many workers, um, unique workers we've encountered. And we've countered something like 75,000 unique workers across everyone's different experiments. So that gives you some sense of, uh, and the ads have been viewed something like a million, almost a million times. So I think, um, 
there's hundreds, there's definitely been hundreds of experiments run using the Scikit-Trick framework, and probably the 15 experiments that have been shared is sort of, uh, I don't know, they probably triple that number for the number of actual implemented things that people have done that just haven't shared it or something like that. Yeah. Um, so I think it's uh, it's it's used pretty pretty widely for a tool like this. I guess. Anything else? Okay, cool. Well, thanks a lot. All right. Well, lunch is ready in the back. Um, again, we'll be reconvening at 1 p.m. for our final.